Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs> good afternoon for some, good morning for others. It is a pleasure once again to be here with you with another uh, episode of Encouragement During Your Time of Fasting, part five. Our final one is going to be tomorrow. Today is day 39 of my 40-day liquid-only fast. And tomorrow at 12 midnight, I'll be ending this. Well, kind of. <laughs> and I'll explain that a little bit later. <laughs> All right? But definitely, uh, definitely, I would be uh, officially, let me put it that way, I would be officially ending my 40-day fast at 12 midnight tomorrow. And again, I'll explain I'll explain uh, that a little bit later, okay? But I'm just going to wait for folks to come in. We are 210. It's climbing rapidly. We're going to wait till we get at 500. And uh, once you would have done the 500 mark, then we would go from there. Today's, tonight, sorry, is going to be an exciting night. In fact, I was supposed to do this from this morning, but after my, my uh, three plus miles walk today, I was really tired. So I took a bath and went to sleep. <laughs> I didn't get much rest last night. But nevertheless, nevertheless, this fast has been extremely interesting. I said to you before, this is the easiest fast I've ever done in my entire life. And I believe it's a testament. It's a testament for the improvements that has taken place in my life since my forty original 40-day fast in uh, 2011, as well as the other in-between fasts, I say to you all the time that your your spiritual life is displayed through your dreams, and you get a more vivid view of that when you enter a fast. And a lot of people would say, well, I have a lot of nightmares and a lot of crazy dreams during my fast. Well, it's showing the condition of your spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And and the fast, the whole purpose of the fast is to undo these uh, forces, these invisible forces, these spiritual forces, to undo the covenants, to undo these strongholds, to undo these spiritual knots that are in your life. And so the fast is to break those things. And we're going to really talk a lot about that tonight, okay? And that's why I encourage you along with the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> that you as a Christian must include fasting as a part of your Christian discipline. And if you are not fasting, then it will probably explain a lot of the stagnation in your life, a lot of the reoccurring consistent issues, negative issues, because the antidote to eradicate these things from your spiritual life so that you can go forward in your physical life is only going to happen when we insert or even incorporate fasting as a part of our Christian spiritual diet or even discipline. So if any church religious leader or person or whatever, if, you're, if fasting isn't a part of your Christian walk, I don't need to know you. I could basically tell you what your life is like. Because the enemy has an has, has a, the upper hand. The reason why he have the upper hand, because Jesus made, Jesus made it very clear. He says, "Listen, it is not necessary for the disciples to fast while he is here. Him being the bridegroom, the disciples, which the original body of Christ, being the bride, he said, there's no need for that. But when I go, you must fast." And he dropped another nugget as to why we should fast in Matthew. 17 and 21, uh, the upper scriptures gives us this scenario of a, a man whose son was, he had a lunatic spirit in one of the gospels, and the other one said that he had a deaf and a dumb spirit, or what have you. Nevertheless, the disciples could not cast this spirit. This, listen, listen to the evidence of what I just said to you. I said to you earlier, listen to this. I just got this just now. I said to you, in order for you to go forward physically in life, you must undo that what has bound you spiritually. And a lot of people don't understand that. 
So here it is, this man came to Jesus' disciples and he told them off the bat, so he had some kind of spiritual knowledge. He says, listen, he didn't say my son is deaf and dumb. He didn't say my son was a lunatic. He said, my son has a deaf and dumb spirit. That's what he said. So basically he had exhausted every avenue of taking him to the doctors, running the uh, MRI back in Jesus' the old have you, and none of that worked. So, so in his understanding of these things, he revert to this must be a spiritual situation. So let me go to the experts in this field, which is the church, who should be advanced in this. So he goes to the disciples and the disciples failed miserably. Jesus, this is our Matthew 17, Jesus then put a little tongue lashing on them and in their humility, they came to Jesus after he would have cast out this devil and say, well, Lord, how is it that we couldn't do these things? And he told them, you know, some things. Then he said, he, he, he centered on this in verse 21 of Matthew 17. He said, he said, this kind, now what is he talking about? Well, let's go back up to the scriptures. The man said that his son has a deaf and dumb spirit or devil. So when Jesus made the statement, this kind, He's specifically referring to an invisible entity that we cannot see. However, he's giving us this very powerful spiritual nugget. He said to deal with this type here, you must incorporate, but it must be mixed or incorporated with fasting. This is so interesting because a lot of times when we read these stories, I don't know if we read them to be entertained or we just read them as just a story. And when you really beg God and say, Lord, open my spiritual eyes to truly understand your word and, and take away everything that was taught, everything that was erroneous, that is, everything that you know that I was taught over the years, that was not your word, that was not the way you intended it to be taught. Remove that from me. Remove the, the tradition. Remove the policies, remove that and, and open my spirit, just like how Elijah said to you, Lord, open the spiritual eyes of his servant so that he could see beyond the physical army and see the spiritual angelic host waiting on the command of Elijah to take down the Assyrian army. Father, open my eyes. I humbly ask you to open my spiritual eyes. What, what do I have to do for you to open my spiritual eyes so that when I read your word, I'm not reading with the base concept or the foundation of some twisted person's view, but what you originally, authentically had in mind when these stories were being created by the inspiration of you. And that's how you have to, and that's how you have to pray to God so that you could see it for what it is. So Jesus says, hey, this kind here, this type of devil, you could pray till the stars fall out of the sky. You could join hands in intercessory. You could call all your friends and affiliates worldwide to your different churches and say, let's go before the throne. It will manifest absolutely nothing. Why? Because when you understand spiritual laws and rules, if you don't respect them, then they won't respect you. And many people are under this illusion and delusion that because I'm a Christian, because I am saved, because I'm Holy Ghost filled and watched with the blood, somehow those uh, titles erase the spiritual laws. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, you're talking nonsense. You're talking fool like we say here in the Bahamas, <laughs> okay? In your walk, and, and even in this fast that I'm doing now, I'm telling you, the Lord has just opened my understanding to so much and stuff that I read over and over, stuff that I've gotten tons of information and revelation from. And being on this fast, reading that again, like I just prayed just now, you pray to say, me, Father, take me deeper into the scripture take me deeper and not only that lord bring other 
scriptures, guide me to other scriptures that will support this. So when I present this, I'm not just preaching from this one line up, but here are the myriad of proof in the scriptures to support this right here. And that's what a good teacher is. A good teacher is thorough in their research before they make their presentation. But more importantly, in order to inculcate this understanding to others, they must be repetitive. And that's why you will hear me being constantly repetitive. So I may take it from a different angle, but I'm inculcating this into your understanding by bringing it from different angles, but basically saying the same thing. Because what am I trying to get to you? The principle, the rule, the law, this right here, this format will operate anywhere in the world you go. So Jesus said this kind will only come out through prayer uh, accompanied with fasting. I, I thought that was just so powerful. Then he goes into some deeper understanding in uh, Matthew 12, 43 to 45. He said, when an evil spirit is cast out of a person, this spirit goes into dry places seeking rest, but find it none. So the spirit says to itself, because it's an intelligent, invisible being. It's not stupid like Christians would say. The devil's stupid, evil spirit's ignorant. Well, they can be ignorant if they're getting you to sin every day. They're getting you to break the laws every day. You show us them who's stupid or you? Because you seem to be succumbing to the tricks they pull on you daily. <laughs> Make me understand. The, the, the proof is in the, is in the eating of the, of the pudding. But nevertheless, Jesus in this particular chapter, once again, has or decided to, to take the believer on a journey into the spiritual world, revealing how evil spirits behave, how they operate, particularly in this case, when they are cast out of a human being. And he's just taking his time with this. He says, listen, listen. First of all, he's saying, yeah, it is possible that a spirit other than your human spirit could reside simultaneously in your physical shell with another spirit. So your human spirit, and there's the spirit of lying, there's the spirit of adultery, there's a the spirit of hate, bitterness, unforgiveness. They are spirits residing in you. The deliverance world call it uh, possession. When they're operating from the outside, it's called oppression. So Jesus is coming off the back. Listen, listen, don't be fooled. Not because you don't see these entities don't, does not mean that they do not exist. They exist. The other day when I was doing the teaching, I was giving you the spirit of pride, the, the, the spirit of lust, the spirit of, of, a lying, of lying. We coexist with these beings and depending if we are ignorant to the rules, we become vulnerable through their trickery for them to legally possess us. So a person who is a consistent, pathological, chronic liar is possessed by the spirit of lying. The spirit trumps his human spirit. So he don't, the human spirit don't get to say, well, no spirit of lying. You don't, no, 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 no. I'm not going to lie today. You ain't going to lie today. You ain't got no choice to lie today. Today you will lie. In fact, for you saying that, you will lie three times more than you lie yesterday. Don't <laughs> you try that? So they have no say. But Jesus says, he says, now listen, when the spirit realized that he cannot find rest, and based on the scripture, the rest would be entering another human being. Hence, they are restless and tortured in a quest and a hunt to possess or even to oppress another human being. But more importantly, to possess them, to inhabit this physical shell. Because they, they know once they're in here, they got plenty legal right now. Why? Because God never gave spirits authority in the earth. He gave it to human beings. So if they can inhabit a human suit, they now dictate the course of that human. 
It's just like a man who have the spirit of lust or adultery and having sex with different women, though he's married. Same thing with a woman. You go beat her up, shoot her, shoot him. You didn't solve anything because you did not kill the spirit. You did not rid it of the spirit. So if you locked them up for 300 years and the spirit was never removed from them, well, after 300 years, when you release them, they're going to repeat the same thing again. Why? Because their human spirit has been subdued and that spirit that caused them to kill the voice poison will now go and do it again. trying to help somebody so Jesus said the spirit says to itself meaning that it has a reasoning ability let me go back to my house or the person that I once inhabited and like I would have said in my previous teaching on uh, this encouragement during fasting nowhere have we read in that scripture where Jesus intervened and says no you cannot go there no, no, there is nothing that could stop that spirit. Nothing. Because according to spiritual law, again, this is not our opinion. That's why I keep saying to you, I don't know how much more I got to drill this to you. Stop listening to people's opinion. You need to know the laws. You need to know the rules. You need to know what you're dealing with. You know, but the first thing this is going to do for you when you equip with the laws, it removes the fear factor from you because you know how to, to navigate through this foolishness. And no matter how much these demons growl and growl, they have to abide by the law. They have no choice. So Jesus, nowhere in that scripture it says that when the spirit decide to revisit the person whom they were cast out of, there was no resistance by heavenly powers or the kingdom of heaven to shut the spirit down. This is why, watch another spiritual law, the law says you, you must work out your own salvation, not your pastor, not Kevin, you, you have an obligation to keep that force out of you. you. There are things that you must change. There's things that you must engage in as it relates to the spiritual world to not give this force the legal right to re-enter you. I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. I don't care how much people scream over you. I believe in deliverance. If there's anybody who believes in it, because I, I know, because I was self-delivered. And no one had to put a hand on me, break no oil over me, put me in the figure four and the headlock, and do the suplex and pile drive on me. None of it. I followed the scriptures. I fasted. I, I, I quoted, repeat the word of God. And they were all gone. So how do we explain that? Coming out, how do we explain this dude here never went through out, 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 fire, fire? Oof, all the what I call it, because nothing I see are the rules of the spiritual realm. What I see is a grand performance. What I see is someone who's seeking attention. What I see someone who's deceiving others as if this is the format that Jesus Christ put in place to get devils out of you, invisible, evil, oppressive forces. There is no scripture that support puff, puff. There's no scripture that support out, out. There's no scripture that supports fire, fire, fire. None. I trying to help you, but I know you, you can defend your preachers, but that on you, buddy, you got to work with your own salvation. I only can teach you it. So the Bible says that when the spirit return, he's looking Remember I was telling you that the man's spiritual state, what did I tell you? I said, when you go on a fast, but in your regular dream life, but more so on a fast, your dreams are going to rapidly increase, rapidly. But what is it doing? The, see, the fast, you, you are now entering another level of warfare. But God got to equip you. So God is now revealing to you, showing you the dashboard of your life through these repetitive dreams. Why are all of my dreams in dark places? It's having sex, dirty, mucky, roaches. Why? That's your spiritual state. Why am I always in a like a cell or a pit? Something have me chained, or my hands are tied up, or my teeth are falling out in my dream? Why? Your spiritual state. These are the symbols revealing to you your spiritual state. So the spirit, according to Matthew twelve forty three to forty four or forty five, it says that the spirit comes back and listen, he sees that the man is 
swept clean and, and garnish or whatever the, the phrases were. So what do you mean? You mean he was swept? You mean he was taking a broom and sweeping his house when the spirit came there? No. The, 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 the Bible, when it used those terms, it was, it was, it's saying that the spirit is looking at the spiritual state of this person to see if it have legal right to re-enter. That's why I say to you, I don't care much how persons claim to speak in tongues, claim to prophesy, claim to be so holy. I don't care. You could fool me for the physical man, but there are forces looking at your spiritual man. I trying to help you. <laughs> I trying to help you. I didn't get all this revelation and knowledge overnight. This came with years of getting beat down, years of practicing the wrong thing over and over, years of following every other rule except the rules of God, which made my journey a little bit longer than it should have been. But when I followed the right rules according to the scripture, I saw results, rapid, multiple results. I'm living, I keep telling you, I'm living here today. And it is amazing that those who would point finger and criticize in bondage. <laughs> I, I just don't get it. But nevertheless, it says that the spirit looks at this man's spiritual state. In fact, let me go there. I want to read it exactly how it is because I want you to understand what exactly is being said here and the spiritual implication that's attached to it. So let's go here to, uh, and this is, this is what I'm talking about tonight. I just feel led to go here for somebody. All right, let's go to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 43. And it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walked through dry places. This is the unclean spirit, seeking rest and finding none. Then he, who is he, the unclean spirit, say it, I will return into my house, excuse me, which is the human that he formerly came out of, from whence I came out. This is the part I want to get to. And when he, who is he, the unclean spirit, when he has come or approached the man whom he was cast out of, he findeth it. Look how it's addressing this. This is highlight this, this particular sentence. He, which is the unclean spirit, findeth it empty, swept, and garnish. What is this it? He find his the, the spirit, the unclean spirit that was cast out. It means the spiritual life of the person whom this spirit formerly inhabited. And it says that when that spirit came, and this is so awesome, nobody could see none of this. Nobody. Nobody could say, hey, spirit of lying, I see you coming back. You Now you better get. You better get. No. Hence, if you don't know the rules, you will never be able to discern, to distinguish, to recognize the invisible forces that's coming against you or even trying to re-enter, you will never know that. If you're just going by theatrics, pump and pageantry, and praise the Lord, hallelujah, out, out, poof, poof, rough, rough, all this gun shooting and cowboy western foolishness. You could imagine. Let me be careful here. <laughs> you know, I can say this. I don't care. I can say this. And this is no disrespect to Mr. T.D. Jakes. I'm not coming at him at all. Imagine if a real spirit break loose, a demonic, angry force erupt in that place. And the person that they're in acting like an animal and firing the most filthiest word, pulling off their clothes, pushing things up their private, attacking people. You think they're going to gather around and say, by the power of the blood of Jesus. No, I can tell you what they can do. Listen. A lot of them will die. You know why? Because when they trample them trying to get out of there. Why will you say that, Kevin? If you don't know the rules, if you don't know the principles, the laws, and how these things are, um, the, the, the protocol, you, you should run. You, you better run. I know of a situation where this particular church, this local church here, there was a spirit that manifested in this particular lady. And one of the ministers, you know, he decided to come and do the regular thing on the, out in the name of Jesus. I bind your powers, you devil. And this man voice speak through the lady and says, you bind the devil and you just was by your side piece or sweetheart house last night. You better know what you're doing. You better know the rules. 
you better make sure your life clean because they are looking in just like with this man here and they're looking at your spiritual state they're looking to accuse you they're looking to 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 expose you sir ma'am so don't come around here you who don't fast you who don't read the word you who are always in, in in conflict over position and so on but have nothing to do with god but you cast no devil you better cast yourself out because they all pile up in you <laughs> huh? so you better get real you get real and he had to he had to he had to sheepishly crawl his way like a sanapi off of that poison and go hide somewhere no boy these things are real get it together these things are real so the scripture says here in verse 44 then he which is the spirit i will return unto my house from whence i came out and when he is out sorry and when he is come spirit of this he find it this is a powerful statement he find it empty swept and garnished meaning that the spiritual state of this man was impeccable that's why i said to you i started out this is the easiest most pleasant uh tolerant fast i've ever had and i said to you it's, it speaks volumes of the improvements i've made over the years with my spiritual life so when my dashboard is displayed to me through my myriad of dreams that i've had I don't see the sexual dreams anymore. I don't see me running from mad men anymore. I don't see dogs coming after me and trying to bite me or someone trying to inject me. None of that. So it's showing me, Kevin, okay, you see, look, this is your spiritual dashboard now. See, here? look at these things now. Look at these. Same thing here with this guy. His spiritual dashboard was clean however that wasn't the end of it and this is why i'm saying to you now if you do not fasting to your christian discipline you begging for problem in fact you become a prime target to the invisible forces of darkness they will put everything else on hold just to come after you especially if you're gifted and for the most part you may not even know that but the mere fact that you're having constant attacks or you're always forgetting your dreams or you can barely remember them are all indicators that you are under heavy spiritual attack. But why? What makes you so special? Your gifts, your talents, what God has called you to do that you don't know of. So they think if they could shut you down in your infancy stage, they're going to never worry about the souls you should have won to Jesus Christ. The knowledge you should have imputed to others through the revelation that God has given you. That's why your attacks are so, so base. I mean, so, so severe. That's why you probably on your second, third marriage. Why do you think that you think that happened by accident? That's why they fire you off the job, even though you did nothing wrong and you brought all this. Why you why do you think these things are happening to you? They're jealous of you? No. The spirit of jealousy were all sent on assignment along with the spirit of lying on you, the spirit of deception, the spirit of manipulation, all working in tandem against you spiritually, but it's manifesting jealousy on the job, victimization. But it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what you're called to be. So the minute they succeed in shutting you down, where you become uh, self-absorbed, oh Lord, why these things happen to me? I give up on life. I ain't into this no more. You still haven't seen what the bigger picture is. The bigger picture does have nothing to do with your career. This have nothing to do with your life, being married, girlfriend, boyfriend, have nothing to do with that. But it have everything to do with the purpose and calling and gifting that God has given you. Everything to do with that. So just, just remove yourself for just one second. I know it's difficult, but try it and look at it for what it really is. If you had no gifts and talents, why would the devil make, waste time with you? You ain't giving no souls in the future. You ain't gonna give knowledge to release the people of God and deliver them. So why would he challenge you? There would be no reason. The only reason he's challenging you because you're carrying something. There is an investment that God made in you before the foundation of the world. And this dude is gonna do everything in his power to shut you down. And mo listen to this, is very careful. this is very important. Most of what he's going to do to you, you going to be a co-conspirator and don't even realize it. Whoa, Kevin, how? Through your ignorance. Through your ignorance. And that ignorance primarily especially for those who are already in church under wrong teachings and preaching, that ignorance comes in the form of tradition. Don't do it God way, do it this way here. 
You can do it over and over. Year after year, you're doing it. No result. Year after year. My season coming. Year after year. I hear pastors say, you can turn around. This this year, this this theme for the church this year is a new season. It's a new day. Mm-hmm, but not for you, though. Keep keep going. Next year, I see God is going to make a release. This is the year of release. Keep going. Nothing happening for you. You done now 30 years in. I, I see there's a shift in the atmosphere. Are you retarded? When are you going to get it? It's not working. How long are you going to take the same part? Every time you drive this road, you get a flat tire. Every time there are multiple ways to get to the destination you want to go to. But you are so programmed that I know I can get a flat tire. So that's why I bring my extra spare tire. When you could take another route, avoid the, fl- the, the tire being flattened. Avoid the time that it's consuming and wasting. Avoid all of that. But tradition is like a spell. Tradition is like a... Like someone have you fix and program, just like how you would put a program in a computer and no matter what, it's going to keep following that program, whether it's right or wrong. And that's how people are. And when you show them the scripture, oh, they mad at you, they wax. Call you everything except a child of God. (laughs) Because they love bondage. They will never tell you, they will never say, I love bondage. But you don't have to tell me, your actions are speaking. Your actions is dictating the course of your life. It's clear. Your actions is telling me what's going up in your head, in your spirit life. So you have to tell me. The Bible say, tell me how to measure what you're dealing with internally. He says, I must judge you or assess you by your fruit. What is it that you can consistently producing believer? Failure. Delay. Backwardness. Anti-progress. Anti-marriage. Barren. Cannot go ahead. But yet you sing in the banner, child, 2022 is my time. I don't care what nobody say. Glory be to God. All I know, I don't care about this big nose, big head, Kevin, boy. All I know is God is going to turn it around. You said that 14 years ago. And you're still doing absolutely nothing in terms of change to at least attempt to get a different end result. They got a spell on you. (laughs) I'm serious. Everybody who telling you a change is going to come, they're flourishing. Rightfully so, because if I think about it, if I say say right now to everybody on you, listen, I hear God say next 90 days, because he, God don't know exactly what day it is. So we got to say 90, just so it happened within there. So you could say it's God. So he don't know, right? The next 90 days, and God said, if you move in faith right now and sow your best seed, in God, th- thank you, Holy Spirit, the best seed, God says, $250. And anyone who sow over that, there's a special blessing for a $1,000 seed. You'll come run and give him the money. Because why? You believe more in your worldly system. That if you got money and you could pay for deliverance, oh yeah, this gonna work. But you will never trust the word of God. You will never say, let me commit to this word. Let me repeat this word. Let me decree, declare. Let me prophesy this word. Let me, I don't care. Until it happens, I will keep repeating it. I don't care what come up against me. I don't care. Rent, mortgage, cut off the light. It don't matter to me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Father God, your word declares that the righteous shall be restored in there. I am going to be restored because I'm sticking on the word of God. No, you don't want that. No, you can go come borrow from somebody. So you can't let me a thousand dollars say for what that's a lot of money. Well, t- anyway, pastor say Jesus say that if you sow thousand dollars, he can give you all your front teeth back and Jerry Curl Kid can come back in to buy a couple Lexus and cars. What 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 devil nest is you going to? <laughs> huh? What demon host this is? Uh, we we're clearly the devil reign up in here. <laughs> okay. I, I just see to me, right? And maybe because I've been free for so long. When you in bondage, you don't see what other people see. You know, you don't see it. You don't see the incarceration that you're in. And the thing about it, you find it pleasurable. So anyway, <laughs> let me finish this up so I get into my sermon. Yeah, okay. We had nine forty three. Let me just quickly end this. So anyway, verse forty four of Matthew twelve. He said, "When the Spirit comes back." The spirit now began to analyze the spiritual state of the person whom he once inhabited. And it says that the spirit find it, meaning the spiritual state of that person, 
empty, swept, and garnished, meaning that it was free of all of the demonic debris that gave that spirit the right previously to inhabit this poison. But it doesn't end there, and this is why fasting becomes a key player, because at this point, this person is maintaining their deliverance, but because their force is greater than this initial spirit that was cast out of them, they must now upgrade their deliverance, and this is where fasting is now inserted. So the scripture goes on to say in verse 45, it says, Then goeth he, who was he? This original spirit that was cast out, but cannot find no legal ground to come back in. But the spirit is an intelligent being. And that's why you need people to understand. The spirit isn't just a floating dark mist. This is an intelligent being. Got everything you have. The only difference is it doesn't have a physical body. So it says in verse 45 of Matthew 12, Then goeth he, which is the spirit, and take with himself seven other spirits. This is the key word here. More, more wicked. More wicked than himself. Mm, why is this interesting? Because while you would have met the requirements to be delivered of this lesser spirit, are you upgrading, okay, your spiritual discipline through prayer and fasting? Because this is what Jesus said, this kind, Matthew 17, 21, will only be cast out, not by prayer alone, he made it very clear, but by prayer and fasting. So clearly this guy wasn't fasting, so the Bible says, listen what the scripture says about him now, verse 45 of Matthew 12, then go with he and take it with himself, meaning the initial spirit. Then he went and get seven additional spirits that were more wicked than himself. And they, they, a total of eight now, the lesser spirit and the seven more wicked spirits. And they entered in, entered in and dwell there. Enter in where and dwell where? In the body, physical body, of this person. So he had a total of eight evil spirits, seven more, more wicked than the original one, simultaneously residing with his human spirit in this physical shell. Scripture. Not my opinion. I don't preach opinion, I preach scripture. So he says, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto the wicked generation, meaning that they will increase in wickedness. Why? Because more evil powers are entering them. Scripture. Not, not my opinion. It's not how I feel. This, this is a reality. This isn't a story book to make to entertain us. Jesus is giving us these powerful nuggets. And, and when you go into the book of like Ephesians and Corinthians, where Paul come and just compound on this understanding, man, listen, it will literally blow your mind that you'll be like, man, all my life I've been reading, I've never seen it this way. No, you've never seen it that way because the spirit of truth was in with you. In fact, probably the places you were, they probably toss him out of there and give their version of truth. So tonight, tonight in this particular teaching on uh, encouragement during your time of fasting part five, I want to speak to you about fate. And for those of you who would have watched my previous videos, I spoke about fate and kind of breaking it down as to what it really is. And many people will give you their version of fate and say fate means that you must believe or be convinced of something or whatever. And that's part of it. It is part of it, but that's not the entirety of it. And I've broken this understanding down on many occasions before and the purpose of doing that was to now begin to take the understanding of what faith is and insert it in the parts of the Bible where faith is actually uh, revealed or displayed. All right. So I want us to go to Hebrews. And I think, well, actually not Hebrews. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 10. I want to make this very quick but in terms of reiterating, breaking down what faith is, so that when we begin to apply it going forward, you are going to see the importance and the necessity of what I've been telling you from day one on my fast. And that is you need to repeat the word of God more often in your prayers while fasting and even not fasting than you repeat what you're requesting from God or what you want him to fix. If you are applying more of what you want, for example, you say, Lord, I want to be married. Lord, I want to be married. You don't have faith. Faith, which is the word of God, 
which is the only thing that pleases him, that is what he wants to hear, which is his word. So let's quickly go here now. I'm going to take my time with this tonight. Let's quickly go here now to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 8, then we can drop to verse 17. Romans chapter 10. And let's go to verse 8, then we can go to verse 17. Romans 10 verse 8 says, But what saith it? It's a question. The word, listen to this carefully now, and, and, and even before I go right now, I pray, Father God, give me the revelation, give me the understanding. Even if there's a revelation that Kevin missed, Father, give me one even beyond what he's saying right now to grasp the holy word in Jesus' mighty name. Romans 10 verse 8, but what saith it? it? The word is nigh thee, or the word is close thee, or in close proximity of thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Now let's 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 step back just a little bit. Don't let's rush it. Let's make sense out of this bad boy. All right. The writer is saying the word of God is very close to all of us, even in our mouth and in our hearts. Listen, that is, that is the word of faith or the word of God, which we preach. Again, you're going to see here a correlation of the word of faith, sorry, being the word of God. He compounds this now, this understanding, when you drop to verse 17 of the same Romans 10. He said, so then faith which he also correlated with the word above in verse uh, 8. So verse 17 of Romans 10 says, So then faith cometh, how does faith, how is, what is the protocol of faith coming to us? By hearing. Hearing disco music? Hearing people cussing and round all the time? No, he's very specific. So then faith cometh by hearing, uh-huh, and hearing. Hearing by, by what? The word of God. Without any other evidence, it is very difficult not to assimilate the understanding that faith and the word of God is synonymous. I want you to hear me tonight. I, I'm looking for no debaters tonight. I'm looking for understanding. So we, I, the purpose of this drill tonight is to show you the importance of application of the word of God, not what you want. You want the car, you, you want a promotion, we got that, God got that. Now, what, what am I bringing? What faith am I bringing? Meaning, what word that correlates from the word of God, what I could look at in a story, in a whatever, and bring this, I'll say, okay, God, so this is, for example, let's say I want favor on my job because I got two people working witchcraft. This one only is a liar, and all of them vying for the position and look like the boss favoring one already. But you are the man or woman of God. Lord, I need favor. Okay, let's look at some scriptures. Uh, Psalms 5, verse 12. What does it say? This God word now. This is why you got to give it back to him. This is fate. He said, he said, Psalms 5, verse 12 says, the Lord will bless the righteous. Mm. Now, let's be clear. See, we need to know the rules. Did it say the Lord will bless anybody? No, I didn't read that. I did not read that. He said the Lord will bless a specific group. In this case, of course. The Lord will bless the righteous. Okay, so the righteous, if you are righteous, and you are the one seeking that promotion, then you know that God owes you a blessing because he promised that if you are righteous, you are subject or entitled to a blessing. But I love the second piece. It says, the Lord shall bless the righteous and with favor shall he encompass or surround you as a shield. My Lord, I could shut this baby down right here. No, listen to this. Did you hear that? That is a promise to the righteous. Are you righteous? Rather than you, you talking fool, but oh Lord, they wicked bitch all day, Jesus. I know I can't get this because they go, go into the obey man, calling up devil, 24-7 demons running around. And say, Why are you discussing that? W what does that have to do with your faith or the word of God? What does that have? To your problem is your mouth. You're talking nonsense. Why are you talking foolery 
when the scriptures you should be pounding on in spite of what you see. Because as I initially started this teaching about the invisible forces conducting business which you cannot see. Calm down, Kevin. You see, this would fast and do to you. It revives you. All right? Like we see in the Bahamas, let me, let me wipe some of this earl off my face. <laughs> I love this, yeah? Listen, other than cooking, my greatest pleasure is teaching. I love it. I This gift of teaching God has given me just to reduce things down, just put it on simmer, just like cooking, to get all those flavors out of it. And that's what we're getting right now. As we just begin to, to really put this word on simmer, now you can see the flavors coming from it. I like that. My wife said, I think I'm some kind of chef boy. I said, no, no, no. Chef boy, I didn't think he's me. <laughs> let's get it right. <laughs> anyway, let's get back here. So what you should be doing, you want favor. You don't beg for favor. No, you don't have to beg for it because it's promised you. What you do is use the promise and give it back to God because that's your faith. And he says, without this, you cannot please me. So God, you tell me all the time, I say, oh Lord, so oh Lord, give Pookie some favor, Jesus. Lord, turn it around, Jesus. Oh Lord, God, oh Jesus. Oh Jesus, oh God, snorting up your nose. What is that doing? Where, where's the protocol that if you snorty up your nose, if you call on Jesus and, and then give this pious voice and start crying, God is going to say, oh Lord, I, you won't follow the rules, but I can do it anyway. You want results, right? Psalms 12, verse 5. Right? I believe it is 12, verse 5 or 5, verse 12. I think it was 5, verse 12. Psalms 5, verse 12. This is what it says. The righteous... The Lord will, the, 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 he will bless the righteous and with favor shall he encompass or surround, surround, let me, let me, let me pull it up. I, I, I don't like to misquote, so let me say it right. Psalms, Psalms 5, verse 12. Listen to what it says. For the Lord will bless the righteous. That's the qualifier there. You, 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 he isn't blessing you for blessing you sake. In this case, because there are many other cases that you will receive of a blessing, but in this case, he says, your righteousness has entitled you to a blessing. I'm going to bless you. What does blessing mean, Kevin? I'm going to empower you to do what you could not do before. The Bible says in... Uh, Genesis 1 verse 28, after he, he created the earth and created the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve was just there, there were some things they couldn't do. So, so we had to bless them. So in verse 28 of chapter 1 of Genesis, it says, and God bless them. Who's this them? Adam and Eve. To do what? He said what? To be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue. They could not do that before. But the blessing is like a program set in them to prosper them, to elevate them, to catapult them, and to do things they could not do before. So he says, for the Lord, Psalms 5 verse 12, will bless the righteous. He finished with him. And with favor will thou compass him as with a shield. He says, listen, because favor is a spirit. Let me be clear there. He's saying the spirit of favor that's around you is no different from a spirit of rejection on a woman who cannot get married. The spirit is influencing others, in the case of rejection, to turn away from this beautiful woman, this educated woman. Everybody and their mother can see how beautiful this woman is, how educated and professional and humble she is, why she can't get married. Because she isn't aware that there is a spirit upon her influencing the spirits of her prospects. No different from the spirit of favor. Because you got the spirit of favor surrounding you now, influencing the decisions of others. When you don't deserve it, because everybody else qualified, you don't have the bachelor's, you don't have the so you got all you have is the years of being on this job. And the favor that's influencing that boss or those panel who's going to assess who's going to get this job, the spirit of favor is dealing with them and they don't even know. And all of a sudden, they say, you got the job, Mr. Ewing. Me? Yeah, you. I talking to somebody, man. I trying to help you. Don't get mad at me. I trying to just, this would fasting do. It's bring the revelation of the word of God. I tell you, when you simmer it down, it brings out all the flavor. I did some curry 
some nice curry for my wife today, right? I did something new today. I uh, rather than doing it with water, I put the uh, nice the, the Thai coconut water in it. And I got those cinnamon sticks and dropped them in there with some bay leaves, with mushrooms and all the works, and just let it simmer down before I put my meat in. Why? Because when I was watching the YouTube guy who was doing this, he says, it's going to bring the flavor out of it. My God. I was almost tempted to eat pizza that tonight. <laughs> anyway, same thing with the Word of God. When you when you repeat it in your mind, when you meditate, see, meditating is like when that food is simmering down, the flavors, the juices, all of them combine, the, the, the onion, the bell peppers, the, the, the mushroom, all of them combine, releasing each individual flavor. But when all of those flavors, when you stir that pot and they all come together, when you taste that, my Lord, mm, same thing with the word of God. That's why I love it so much. The flame, what you're getting right now is the flavor from it. They're talking to somebody. Let me stop. I got one more day, Kevin, before you go jump in that pot right now. <laughs> <laughs> serious. <laughs> so, so like I said, you want favor, so you find scriptures that are relative to what you want. Another scripture I love is, uh, I pray it all the time in my prayer, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. What does it say? Excuse me. It says, forsake not mercy, neither truth now these are the protocols he's telling the believer to follow if he want favor and something else he says forsake not mercy neither truth kevin and in so doing you will find favor and good understanding why would he say good and why didn't he say and you shall find favor and understanding well the mere fact that the word good, which is an adjective to describe the understanding, well, it simply means that there is also bad understanding. But he's saying if you follow this protocol, you will never have to contend with the bad understanding because the protocol will produce favor as well as good understanding. Why is this important now? Well, let's go back to what I said. Faith is the word of God. So I'm now going to go to God with my money, not see it, not the garbage they're telling you in church, I'm going to him with his word. I'm going to him with the spirit of faith, which is the word of God. Why? Because according to Hebrews 11 and 6, he did not say it is impossible to plead me without, please me without seed. It is impossible to plead me, please me without offering and tithe and, and, and a jump around and foolishness. It is impossible to please me without faith, my word. Why are you not bringing this to me? Why am I constantly telling my servants to tell you this, but you refuse to break your tradition? You refuse like a fool. You run and put money to the altar. I am not pleased by that. You could take $66 trillion and put it to the pastor feet. That's not going to change or alter anything from a spiritual perspective. Why didn't you bring scriptures up there? trying to help you that's all they're trying to do so he says forsake not mercy protocol always look at the protocol before the law is revealed he says forsake not mercy neither truth uh proverbs 3 verses 3 to 4 3 and 4 forsake not mercy neither truth uh let me read it again let me let me pull it up i want to read it correctly proverbs chapter 3 verses 3 to 4 says let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Be honest and be merciful to other th people. Be merciful and honest. Merciful meaning always help other people. Show mercy. Show kindness. Show humility. Because these two forces working together is going to pr produce something that would have you or normally wouldn't have happened to you under normal circumstances. So he says, "Let not mercy and truth forsake thee." He says, "Now bind them about thy neck." Bind, what about my neck? Mercy and truth. What is he saying? Clearly you cannot bind mercy and truth behind, around your neck. He's showing you this how much it should be attached to your life. This how much it should be inculcated and incorporated into your life that it would be an, a normal thing. He said, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them 
upon the table of thine heart. Okay, I did all of that. Now what's going to happen now? He says, so shall thou find favor. Put a full stop right there. Put a full stop right there. Put a full stop right there. We both go deep right now. Okay, I will be a school big year on because we ain't coming up. Now, if you ain't ready for this school, go to some other Mickey Mouse place. Listen to this. He says, when I follow the protocol in verse 3 of Proverbs 3, the result is produced in verse 4. But he's making a statement that's kind of challenging, though. He says, I'm going to read verse 3 again. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of, our, of thine heart. That's how close you should keep it to you. When you would have followed this protocol, he says, so now, or the result, so shall thou find favor. Find. Find the statement or the word itself, find, means that I was looking for favor before. Help me. I was looking for the vote, but I couldn't find it because I wasn't following the protocol. So he's telling you now, he says, now you will find not just favor by following the previous protocol that you have to do. He says, so shall, so shall thou find favor and good quality understanding in the sight of God and man. Meaning that you're going to have favor with God as well as the boss, as well as your wife, as well as your children, as well as these people you're trying to do a contract with. But I got to follow the protocol. Nowhere in the protocol is he saying, put seed or monies. That's what they call seed in churches today. Turn God house. I do a major teaching. When I done with this fast, by the time I finish with these clowns about sowing seed, they, they, they can close down their church because there's nothing but idolatry and witchcraft and voodoo and obel. I am reading and I can read multiple scriptures where you are given a specific protocol that these false teachers are not telling you, forget that. You don't need that foolishness. Bring a seed. Talking garbage. He says, so shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. God, you're telling me. I'm trying to get this contract, Lord. I'm trying to get this. God, and, and listen, I ain't meeting half of the requirements that people need. But you're telling me, if I follow this protocol as a righteous man, as a believer of Jesus Christ, you're telling me that not only will I find favor and good understanding, but it is not just limited to you, but also to mankind. What well, part of the scripture you didn't understand? That's what I said, eh? That's what the scripture, I mean, it's clear. All this, you don't hear none of this. You don't hear none. All you hear is spiritual covering. All you hear is seed. you got to be under the apostolic. All the garbage. That's why your life is in cycles. That's why those who you're giving all your money is too rich, living the big life and telling you, telling you, fools, how God blessed them. And you struggling every day. When the scriptures are here to provide for you, but you don't want that, you want drop $5 million to pass the feet or throw it up on the altar and let them run on the altar and say, money, money, come it now. <laughs> Boy, look, your God got to punish these dudes. I'm serious. So as I was saying earlier, faith is the word of God. And God says it's impossible to please me without faith or without my word. When you come to me, I am begging you. I already know your problem. Yes, you could state your problem in the initial stages, but I don't need to be hearing that over and over. I don't need to be hearing, God, heal me from this cancer. I don't need to be hearing, Lord, I need a promotion. I don't need to be hearing, God, take my son off drugs. I don't need to be hearing that. Not only had I known you would have encountered this problem before it even was initiated, what I want to hear is what does my word, I said to you, my word cannot return unto me void or unaccomplished or incomplete. I never said your word. I said my word. I said I put my word above my name. I said heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one speck, tittle, whatever of my word shall not come to pass. So why am I not hearing my words during your fast? 
Why am I not hearing my word during your regular prayer? Why? Because it's tradition that you keep repeating, even though Jesus come back in Matthew 6 and he says, listen, do not be repetitious like the hypocrites. You know what the word repetitious mean? To repeat and say something over and over and over and over again. God want to hear his word. Let's look at some more scriptures here, all right? Let me put this over here, because we're going deep tonight. We can go very, we're doing some major surgery tonight, all right? Now watch this. Let's go to Hebrews. I'm just going to go over this just for a little bit before I get to my main scripture. So let's go to Hebrews. Oh, where are we? Okay. Hebrews chapter 11. And let's look at verse 1. All right? Remember, we're talking about faith now. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And if those of you who watch me a lot, you know I repeat this all the time because, again, I'm trying to inculcate it into your cerebral cortex. So, anyway, now faith is the substance, circle the word faith, is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, faith will be the the exchange, or this will be the battering system. I give you, I want that, so I will give you this. So if I give you this, you give me that. I give you a whole pig, you give me a, a, a cow, <laughs> all right? I give you whatever. We just change it. We're just exchanging, battering, okay? The scripture says, now faith. Now we've discovered that faith is, in fact, the word of God. So it says now or immediately right now, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow. Now faith, now the word of God is the substance or the currency or the material of whatever it is I'm hoping for. So when I talk, when the Bible talk about my faith, he says, okay, Kevin, you, you, the, what you hope for is the house. What you hope for is to be married. What you hope for is a car. What you hope for is a better life because your life is miserable. He says, okay, then, where is your faith, which would be the substance of what you're hoping for? So I go to the scriptures because I was hoping for favor. That's what I was hoping for from God. So I will go to the scriptures, like I just told you, Psalms 5 verse 12, as well as Proverbs chapter 3 verses 3 and 4, and many other scriptures that speaks about favor. And I says, okay, God, now this is my fate, which is the substance of the favor from my boss I am hoping for. Watch this as it isn't done. This faith is also the evidence, or the word evidence means proof. This is to support the proof of the things I don't see yet. Well, let's break it down. I want the pro I want favor. I want promotion. So, in order to based on the odds stack against me, the only thing that could help me is favor. All right, good, because the Bible have an antidote for that. All right. So he says, okay, now, don't come to me. Oh Jesus, Lord, turn it around, Lord. If don't come, give me these stupid promises, Lord. If you give me this promotion, oh Lord, I can buy a car, pick up all the church members, and drop them in the church. I ain't got absolutely for nothing, Lord. I can buy them food every day. You're a liar. Stop it. Just follow the rules. You want that promotion. So you come before God. You make your initial statement, Father, I'm believing you for promotion on my job. However, I need favor. I need the spirit of favor to encompass me. So I now go to the scriptures. I pray the scriptures. So faith in and of itself isn't just the word of God. This was the, this was the next piece come in where most people label as faith, which is to believe. No, that's just a part of it. Faith is the word of God. My belief in the word of God now is the second part of the of the, the, the this protocol. I'm not just repeating the scripture, you know. My belief, and this is where the key ingredient, this is the real flavor can come from this right now. My belief in the word of God should trump what I'm asking for. Kevin, make me understand that. I am believing for a house. I'm believing for favor. I am believing to be married. Good, but that should not be my focus when I come before God because he told me it is impossible to please me without faith, without my word and believing in my word. So my whole fasting and praying for whatever it is with my uh, correlating scriptures, my focus can be on the word. My, I can repeat this. I can beat this baby down. I can marinate this in my, I can decree, declare it. Listen, 
I don't need to be asking for the favor no more. The scriptures will speak for me. Father, your word declares, Lord, that, that you will bless the righteous and compass them as with a shield. Your word declares that we must not forsake mercy and truth, but bind it upon our necks and write it upon the table of our heart. And in so doing, shall we find favor and good understanding before man. Those of you who are married, married men, you're married with your wife. What it says, according to Psalms, Proverbs 18, verse 22, he that finds a wife, find it a good thing. And what's the benefit from it? And he shall obtain favor from the Lord. Father, I am binding myself to these scriptures. Not what I want. You know what I want. I know what I want. But my confidence, my faith is in your word. I believe what this word say over what I want. Because according to your word, it is my faith, which is my currency or the substance of the house that I'm hoping for. The same word of God will also be the evidence of what I don't see yet. Kevin, how you know you can get this house? How you know you can get the favor? Because the proof or the evidence is the word of God that decrees it. He says, I will bless the righteous and with favor shall I encompass them. Who am I talking to tonight? Your, your, your baby's sick. Your husband's sick with COVID and all you doing, oh Lord, all you all come on Facebook, come join me in prayer right now. You don't know the rules. You don't know the rules. Don't try to get people in a frenzy. You need to know the rules. So when they go before the throne room of God, they go in with the protocols. They go in with the word. They go in with faith. They're not going there whining and crying and, oh, Jesus, Lord, don't let Paul dead. Oh, Lord, he can't breathe. Oh, I just got the last message. They say, Paul only using one lung. You all pray for the next lung to get in faith and such. Nonsense. Nonsense. Where is your faith? Where is the word of God? And this is why the word of God, it is that's why when we read in uh what it was, second, no, Romans 10, verse 8, he said, The word is nigh you, close you, even in your mouth and in your heart. Why is this important to know? Because seed, you could could you put a seed down now for this? Your child, okay, is, the oxygen level has dropped dramatically. All right. In fact, they're about to run out of oxygen and giving it to your child. What point now do you, do you go to the church now and put down a seat? Do you call pastor now, pastor, I want so $5,000 in your life because my child is about to die. God will not hear you. Your child will die because you are following a protocol that is not scripture. He said the word of faith is nigh you even in thine heart. So what I do, I speak the word of God and I believe the word of God. Father, yes, my child is in their suffering, but your word said because of your stripes, he or she is, they are healed. Father, I'm believing this word. I bind my spirit to the word of God that declare healing. I speak, decree, declare. You said you decree a thing, it shall be established. You said that healing is the children's bread. You said that you, O oh Lord, are Jehovah Rapha, the God that healed us. Why are you not saying this? Everybody on the phone, mumble, blah, 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 turn it around, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. What, what you saying? Is the word of faith incorporated in what you're saying? Because if it's not, it is clear in what we're about to read, you are not pleasing God. People, I can say this again, write this down. People that do not know the spiritual rules are motivated by fear, but never by faith. Write that down. Someone post that. Post that. When you do not know spiritual rules, your motivator, that what causes you to respond, is never fate, but always fail. You fear the child can die. You fear they're not giving him enough oxygen or whatever. You fear the doctor's report. Where's your faith? Meaning, where is the word of God in all of this? Everybody huddling around, talking negative junk. You know Pookie dead the other day, right? My God, I know this ain't the right time, is it? But you know he dead from the same thing, right? Yes, yeah, long as he had pneumonia, my God, boy, this COVID is a devil. My Jesus, Lord, his judgment. Listen, 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 listen. Fair, that's how fair operates. And all of the believers are here sitting down and giving God no money. And what is the money? No fate. Because that's the currency of heaven. That's what they accept from the believers, fate. Why? Well, let's read why. Let's drop to verse 6 of Hebrews 11. 
but without faith, mm, come here. And what is faith again? The word of God. Not just the word of God, but the but the concrete belief in what the word say, not what my circumstances attempting to dictate to me. What my what, what does the word say? He says, but without faith, it is impossible. Cannot happen. It is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. I dare anybody on this line listening to me right now, if you are a man or woman who desire to be married, if you are a person who is sick or you have a relative that is sick, follow this very simple principle that I tell everyone that follow me. Put your faith in the word of God. Put your belief, your confidence in the word of God. Give God back his word. Whenever you pray, stop praying the situation. You don't do that. You've done, you finish with that. Give God back his word as it relates to the situation. And watch. Decree it, declare it, speak it, talk it, say it in your spirit while you're driving, while you're on the job, while you're running, while you're exercising, while you're eating. God, I'm only reminding you, say to, you say to bring you in remembrance of your word. Why would why didn't he say bring him in remembrance of what you've been begging for, Kevin? No, he don't want to hear that. He takes pleasure in listening. Why? Because he says, if you, if if my word abide in you, okay? He, no, he says, if if I abide in you, and you if calm down, Kevin. So you get a little excited. You get excited. If you abide in me, and my word, which is fate, abide in you whatsoever you shall ask shall be granted to you wow jesus why didn't you say if 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 i if, if i abide in you and and the, and the seed you didn't read that right but you all don't know much i hate when i say i hate i hate with a passion when i say if i go to a church any church someone invite me to and they say bring seed i out of there because you are going against the laws of God to bring the manifestation of the word. I cannot hear, I can't, based on the non-understanding that I have about the power of the word, the faith, which is the word of God and the, the concrete belief in it. I cannot listen to a pastor say to me, come bring your best seed, come sow a seed for your miracle. You, you, you just turned me off right there. I don't care who you are. I will not listen to you at that time. Now, there may be things you good at preaching on. And again, I never throw away the, the baby with the bath. Like we say in the Bahamas, I chew up the meat and spit out the bones. I will listen to you probably in the future teaching difference. But you better don't say gift seed because the minute you say that, the my TV off, my computer off, my laptop, tablet, phone, everything off. I don't listen to garbage. I don't listen to trash. I don't want to hear so into this ministry and God is going to bless you. Now, I'm not a fool. Every ministry needs finances, but like I do all the time, I don't beg you because I believe if I give the authentic word of God, God is going to touch your heart. Whether you respond to that or not, that on you got nothing to do with me. I will put the information there if you choose to give, but you will never hear me telling you. And listen, all I say, let me be clear here, because there are plenty of people who have different ways of asking for seed. I made this very clear from my earlier part of ministry. Several things I don't do. And the, the reason why I did this is because I made a vow to God. This Kevin Ewing, this, this isn't a general statement. I said to my savior, Father, I will never beg for money. I will never tell someone so into my ministry to tap into my anointing. I will never give these marketing gimmicks garbage. None of it. Same thing I do with honorarium. When I'm invited someplace, the first thing they ask, minister, what is, and you know what they say to me? What is your honorarium? We don't care how much it is. We won't take care of that. And I say to them, I don't believe in an honorarium. I believe the gospel is free. I don't believe in giving an invoice to minister the word of God. I don't believe in that. Now, here is my condition. If you choose to bless me, if you choose to bless my ministry or even my wife, I have no problem with that. But in terms of me saying I charge 5000 10000 and bring a, a, a down payment of 20000 no. The only mandatory requirement that I request, if you're inviting me, you're inviting me, I do not leave it out my wife. She accompanies me everywhere that I go. That's how we operate. And you will have to take on the 
accommodation, the lodging, the food, the transportation, which is only fair. You invited me. Now, when it comes to payment, that's to it totally up. To if, if you feel that you don't have to give me a penny, that on you, my joy, my goal is that I executed the word of God without any form of, when I don't do this, I know I get more than $2,000. No, that's not my motive. And, and I would never tell you the, the real depth reason why I think that way. There's, there's a lot of more to that, and I'll probably reveal it one day. But part of it is I just got sick and tired of seeing this evil habit of preachers turning into rock stars to the extent they make a demand. I was a part of a church that invited some very high-profile preachers, and when I saw the negotiations and the contracts and what they demand, I, is, this, is this the world standard of God? So I vow, I vow to God, never. Everywhere you see me was invited. My, my friend, Dr. Alexis right now, and this is my disclaimer. I said, if a person owns a church and you have a conference, I don't see the reason why you have to charge people to come there. Why? Like Dr. Alexis, this woman is shelling out monies to get the venue, pay for plane tickets, pay for me and my wife, pay for hotel, every, she must charge a fee to defray the, this cost. But don't tell me you have a church for the people to come there freely and you're charging them the registration and all this foolishness. No, boy, I don't believe in that. That's Kevin. I'm just telling you me. You're just saying gospel. They're saying the scriptures. This is me. This is me. So when I come, I come with a spirit of humility. I'm not coming there, boy. I, I know this could be some big money. No. 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 I give the story all the time. I was invited to a particular place, and the gentleman said to me, I'll pay you $6,000 you come. I say, sir, I don't, I don't feel released in my spirit to come. He called me again. I said, I don't feel released. I said, when I'm released, I will come. Because I ain't no money bandit. I ain't no money hog. I ain't desperate. But I finally got the release. When I got it, he gave me $7,000. Before I left, he gave me another $50,000. Never asked for it. This is what God, so many people don't understand. When you are not walking by fate, but walking by faith, what if they can pay me? What if they can give me up? I need to pay this. Like, but you, you in the, the spirit of God ain't in you, and that's why I could say what I say and do what I do. And, for, and guess what? My, I'm very successful at what I do. And how is Kevin being so successful if he don't believe in tithe? If he don't believe in seed? He don't believe in honorarium. But what do you believe in? God Almighty. Fate. That's what it's called. You should try it, preacher. Try it. I've been blessed tremendously throughout my ministry. Never ask for a penny. Never ask to come on any one stage or pulpit. Never, never. The favor of God. You listening to me now, right? The favor of God. Unction them. So don't tell me. I don't listen to these clowns. They, they can run with garbage all they want. At the end of the day, my heart is clean. I never tell them so and tap into no anointing, none of it. And I will never, as long as life is in this body and air in my lungs, never, because I don't believe in it. I don't believe in seeding. I don't, I believe it's a gospel of Satan. And the, the, the teaching I'm putting together right now, I'm taking it from the life of uh, Adam, all the way down to Revelation showing you each individual man and woman of God that God called, and we will find no evidence where any of them said, bring a seed and watch God meet your need. Plant into this ministry, sow into this. Never. I'm going to show it to you. And at the end of the day, you tell me, why can't I see Jesus Christ begging for seed? Why can't I see Ezekiel, Hezekiah, Moses, Nehemiah, Ezra? Why can't I see Joshua, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, why can I see none, no evidence, period, where people come and put money to their feet, money on the altar, see, 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 see. What I did see, though, that was consistent with all of them, the word of God, faith. So don't come talk no mess to me. Don't come talk no fool. You will never convince me. You will never in this life convince me that you could give God cash, money, and he will circumvent his rules and do what he said. He was a liar. He was a thief. And I have no respect for you, none. And the reason why I'm so angry, man, I didn't mean to go this way today, but this is how angry I am with this. What these people are doing to you is pulling you away from the authentic protocol of the scriptures. They, are, they, they will never teach this right here. To put your confidence in the word, not money, not seed. 
it's annoying. I came here to change my life. I came here to hear something that will give me a revelation to make a, a turn around. And all I hear this joker up here telling me I need to sow into this good soil. Like there's some proof of it. Nobody's being healed. Nobody's being saved. People dying from COVID up in here. No healing. All this supernatural power you preach about. No life is being turned around. So what? How, what's the other than you saying that this is good ground to sow in? What is the other evidence? Because like we say in the Bahamas, no fishermen call their fish stink. So explain to me outside of your declaration that this is good ground. What can I look at and see? How many souls have been won over the two-year period? Huh? How many healings took place here? How many deliverance and marriages been restored? Talk to me, man. Let me calm down a little bit because I just, I'm just fed up with it. I'm just tired. And so many people, especially new converts, are coming into this lane of robbery where they believe that they got to sow a seed. They, nobody is look, literally depending on the word of God, declaring the word of God and telling people, put your emphasis on the word of God. No, well, I wouldn't say no one. No one that I've heard. Listen, put emphasis. I ain't saying they didn't preach the word. Put emphasis emphasis on the word of god that's what i'm saying and again let me be clear if you decide to give someone or preach or church money and you say lord i'm believing you for so and so lord and i will make this sacrifice lord but the truth is lord i'm making the sacrifice but my belief is in this scripture though see see that's the difference don't believe that the money is going to cause god to give you favor no just like fasting i am fasting that's my sacrifice but it's the word of god that what i am really pointing to same thing when you say okay let me let me bless lord i'm gonna for example fasting is a perfect example you say okay lord again go on this fast and i hear brother kevin been just giving a scripture after scripture about how he must give to the poor father i can make this sacrifice this is something that i need i need this money to do whatever but I'm going to follow your law and watch the sacrifice. I'm going to sow this into this person's life who need it. You got me there? In a case like that, man, I, I will help you sow there because you're following a rule, a principle. But again, I search the scriptures in my study. I look at Moses. I look at Abraham. I look at Jacob. I look at Isaac. I look at uh, 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 Joseph. I look at the, 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 the kings that were right before God during the time of kings in Israel. I, I look at Ezra, Obadiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nahum. I look, I look at Jesus. I look at Paul, Matthew, Luke, John. I look at Timothy. Nowhere have I found a shred of evidence where any of these godly men required seed for god to do something nowhere so where did we get this demonic from foolishness from where did we get these charlatans coming in here and replacing the word of god you could you don't need to read that bible just put your hope in your 50 dollars. put your hope in your two thousand dollars they are liars they are liars and i hope i i hope i irritate them i hope i'm making them angry i hope i'm offending you remember you got to stand before the same god that you preach about every sunday liar Stop telling, tell these people to depend on the scripture, depend on the word of God. That's what you need to be dependent on, liars. Suck at them. I just tired of them, man. I just, the, the, the hypocrite, and the only person who being blessed is those who get the money, while the rest of them who funding these people on their backs. So the pastor, of course, he can come up there, yeah, your tithing really work, you know. Of course it's going to work for you, pastor, only you getting it. You know, seed sowing really, of course it's going to, you, you are able to buy Lexus, jet set around the world, eat uh, steak caviar while I like eating corned beef and mackerel on the pies in the skies while you live in your, 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 your good life now off of our box, but I have nothing to do with fate. Talking nonsense. That's why people come talking mess to me. Oh, Kevin, uh, I hear you talking about don't pray tight. Watch, watch the lack of faith and fear. How the pastor supposed to be uh, fed and eat and take care of his family? How to rent in, in an air condition? I don't know. Try faith. Try putting your confidence in God as opposed to how money is going to come to the church to pay the bills. You tried that yet? Because you should be trying that. That should have been your initial attempt as opposed to depending 
on the hands of men. The Bible says, according to Jeremiah 17 and 5, that the, the arms of flesh will fail you. It didn't say fate will fail you. Mm. Anyway, back to the regular scheduled program. <laughs> I just, y'all don't know, yeah? You, you can imagine preaching your long sword and getting the unauthentic word of God, the, the authentic word of God on your sorry. And, and through your fasting and the revelation and the understanding that God gives you to hear someone stand on the pulpit and talk rubbish, boy, I, I don't know, y'all y'all got nerves of steel. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't, not me. I couldn't take it. I, 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 listen, I told my friend, this, listen, if you invite me to the church, whether it's for christening or wedding or whatever, the, the day I hear seed, the day I hear seed, don't be offended. I, I, the, he could be in the middle of his preaching. I grab in my keys, grab my baby, baby, let's get, you know Kevin don't listen to this garbage. Let's get out of here. Now the rest of this I'll watch on tape and just delete the seed part because I don't listen to garbage. I don't listen to foolishness. What I do listen to is preachers impregnating the congregants with the word of God and, and getting people to focus on God's word. That's what Kevin listened to. Other than that, the rest is rubbish talking mess so in hebrews 11 verse 6 he says it is impossible to please god without his word he needs his word now let's now really jump into this right so let's go here to first timothy first timothy chapter 6 okay let's go to first timothy chapter 6 and i want us to read well verse 12 is going to be our base scripture all right, I can do this very quickly because I really give you all of the meat already. Oh, excuse me, get some water here. What I'm about to share with you right now is some heavy, heavy revelation that that God literally drowned me in uh, earlier today. And when I read it, I've read the scripture many times before, but man, look here, I, I mean, this thing just stood out to me. Now, before we get to verse 12, right, I want us to read, I want us to go from verse 3. Let's go from verse 3. And we can, we can end on verse 12, and I will expand on verse 12 based on what we would have read from verse 3 to verse 12, okay? But really from verse 3 to verse 11. So First Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, if they're teaching things that are contrary to this such as seed sowing, which is against the gospel of godliness. Hmm. Verse 4 of 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, right. Let me go back, go back at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Mm -hmm. He is proud. But he didn't show any arrogance, no. To go against the word of God as a mere mortal, you are a proud person. He is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words, always looking for controversy into the debate. Where of come it, li listen what the Bible is saying. Anyone that is preaching another gospel that is contrary to the gospel of godliness, according to verse 3 of First Tim Timothy 6, verse 4 now shows a fruit that will be produced from such behavior. Initially, beginning with the person being proud and they're ignorant, to not know something, meaning that you're ignorant. That's what it's basically saying, right? Now watch this though. He says they're doting, they don't know, they know nothing but doting about questions and strife of words. Wherefore, what's going to be produced? This is why I wear the shirt all the time. I do not debate scripture, and the back of the search says I only obey it. I will, I will not debate nothing with you. 
It says, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words. Whereof, what was going to be produced from this person if you allowed him to engage you? Envy. Mm, make me understand that, Kevin. Why would the first word be jealousy, which, which, which really means envy? See, because you, Kevin, you're preaching something that is either never preached or rarely preached. And you're saying stuff that even though it's controversial because it's tradition, but you're showing scriptures to prove what you're saying, multiple scriptures actually. So those who do not pre preach the gospel of godliness are going to envy you because now more people saying, I want to hear more about what he's saying, especially the spiritual world and dreams and stuff and so on, generational curses. And what he's saying makes sense because I'm listening to his personal stories and how he's tying it in with scriptures and showing us that there is a pattern behind these things. This guy makes sense. So what happens now? He says, those who are not preaching this becomes jealous of this person who is. Hence the slander and trying to degrade them and make, because they're trying to trump them by saying, no, 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 stick to tradition. Don't listen to this guy. He's a newcomer. He isn't one of us. He's not a part of the, he's trying to divide the crowd. But, but what he's saying is scripture. And this teaching is saturated with scripture and everything he's saying, he's pointing you to, how could he be not one of us? In fact, when I read out, you seem to be more not one of us than he is because you're telling us riddles and rhymes and God is going to do a new thing and spin around and double for your trouble, but you give us no scriptural support, but you beg us for money every two seconds. We got to show this seed, monkey seed, first fruit seed, church step seed. I put on a new pair of tennis seed, just get the Jericho, that seed. But he's never saying this to us. This man is constantly pointing us to the word of God. This man is saying, whatever you want is in the word of God. So he says here, from these proud, arrogant, know nothing people, ignorant people, he says, if you're engaging them, these are the spirits, I want to be clear here now, that's going to erupt from them. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. He says the first one you're going to have to deal with is envy. Envy is going to now bring forth the spirit of strife, railings, evil surmising. But they're supposed to be men of God. Really, I just told you they were proud. I just told you they were preaching a gospel outside of the gospel of godliness. How could they be men of God? They are men of God in color. They are men of God in title. And that's what, again, you are falling through tradition because they say they're a pastor. They say they're an evangelist. They say they're a teacher. But nothing of what they're saying is resonating with scripture other than their personal views and twisting scripture to get you to give them money and to look at them as the one that you come to for a covering. So he says, these are the spirits in verse four of First Timothy six that's going to be that's going to that's going to come out of them, or erupt from them to come against you. So verse five says, perverse. It isn't ending there in verse four. He says, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain. Listen, that gain is godliness. This is what he says, from such withdraw yourself. So to them, and, and we see it today, to them, God bought me a brand new Mercedes. Glory be to God. I got a three, uh, 500 bedroom house with 600 baths. You see God blessing me. The scripture says to them, listen to what it says, to them, gain is godliness. Material things, the accumulation of wealth, to them that represent that God is with me. Glory be to Jesus. All y'all are there broke like the ten. Come, yeah, we broke because we keep giving you all our money. You're right, we broke. So the scripture is saying that these twisted people have twisted the scriptures in such a way that they're conditioning those whom they minister to that if you're not accumulating wealth, you're not godly. I'm reading it right here. But let's see what else the writer has to say. Verse 6 of First Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You remember what I told you yesterday? What I keep reiterating to you yesterday, I said, listen, listen. True happiness is appreciating what you have now. Not complaining, not murmuring, not say, boy, when I get the big house, I won't be like, pastor, I have seven Mercedes in my garage. No! 
you will forever be in a rat race. You will forever be seeking happiness through material things. He says, whatever, well, listen, happiness is what I have. I appreciate what I have now. Why? Because I didn't have this before. It may not be what I want or what I aspire, but the fact is I'm here right now. And if I could get this far, I know I could go further. So listen to this. He says, but godliness, verse 6 of 1 Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment. What does that mean? Gratefulness. I'm contented and I'm happy. No, I don't have a Mercedes to ride. I don't need that because the same little piece of car taking me to the same place as your Mercedes could go. I will probably get that one day in the future when I would have arrived and did what I needed to do and probably bless myself or, or give myself a little treat. Fine. But right now, I don't need to put myself in expense. So everybody... I pay $60,000 for this thing only for someone to say, that's a nice car. That's not going to pay the note on that. But if I wait and be content and let God elevate me, God will give me something that I don't have to pay for because I can pay it debt free. Mm. Mm, I know they hate me tonight. I love when I, I, love when I offend them. I love it. Mm. But godliness with contentment is great. He didn't say just gain. He said godliness with contentment. When I receive the word of God with contentment, when I appreciate what God has blessed me with the gift of life to wake up and to, to breathe in the fresh morning air, to go on a walk, to endure a fast, to know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't have to be worried about death like how I used to when I wasn't saved, wondering if I go sleep tonight, if I die in my sleep. I know I was going to hell. I don't have that no more because according to scriptures but godliness with contentment he says is great it isn't just your normal grain gain he says great exceeding the normal then verse 7 for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out verse 8 of first Timothy 6 says and having food and raiment let us be there with contented or grateful. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare or a trap and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10. He's going to get a little deeper now. I keep telling you about the siege, you know, the scriptures radio. For the love of money hmm, is the root of of all evil for the love of money see it see it see it see it see it see it bible is giving you a hint here those who are constantly begging you for see it see it see it and not telling you the word of god there's a revelation in the scripture this ain't the scripture being compound on but read that first sentence for the love of money see every time you come in there you don't pick up four or five offering now you're telling them so see it you come back now you need the bus seed the church this seed see it see it for the love of money what's the result the root of all evil Let's look at it from a different way. He didn't say for the love of money is the root of evil. Uh-uh. He said the love of money is the foundation of all evil. You all see why I hate seed so in ministries? Because it's of the devil. You all reading the scripture? I'm not twisting it. Read, listen what it says. For the love of money. You all, if you all want to be honest with Kevin Ewing right now, be honest. You all could think of a church or a ministry right now. Every two words is seed. Every time it's time to collect offering and, 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 and tithe, they spin the record of Malachi again, which is, again, not for you, but I even go into that because I can deal with that comes out. They come in. The seventh cycle of the tithing system that nobody practiced, only they receive from the tithe. But that's a different story. I deal with that come Saturday, God spend my life. But check this out. Think about a ministry that you go to every second, every moment, sow into the soil, bring your best seed to the altar and sow for your husband, sow for your miracle. How many conferences you've been to, the lying prophet and prophetess and lying pastors and teachers tell you says, God says, whoever bring a hundred dollars up here, he's going to bless you, the husband, my God. This man who was created in the image of God is only worth a hundred dollars. You all hear this? You all have listened to these fools? And what are they telling you? 
You tell me a woman could get a whole educated Harvard degree man huh, with couple masters and doctorate for you who ain't living right, you who don't read no Bible, you who don't fast, you who don't sleep with everybody and the uncle, but this guy is telling you you could come here and break off one whole hundred dollar bill. No, you could bring it in once, two fifties or straight hundred. And God will give you a man who disciplined himself, who loved Jesus, who was humble and gifted to the poor. But for a hundred dollars, God said, I'm going to give you this good, decent man, even though you ain't decent. <laughs> Boy, yo, I don't think y'all listen to these people, you know. Y'all don't listen to them. Y'all don't listen to these people. Y'all don't, that's why they got y'all like fools. Y'all don't listen. Think about it. Think about it. A whole hundred dollars. Plant a seed in the ground of a hundred dollars. Now, even the world got a better standard. Y'all ever used to watch, I used to, when I was a young boy, I used to watch this a lot called the the five million dollar man, Steve Austin. Right? I know you all I know you all who are my age, 50, 51, y'all should know that, right? At least they had some decency. <laughs> okay. At least put a five million dollar tag on the fella. Give, give, give him some decency, some some respect. But the the pastor is telling you, the prophet is, the prophet is saying, you who refuse to go to school to educate yourself, who refuse to improve your life, who definitely don't have a relationship with God, and he isn't making any form of uh, uh, disclaimers. He's saying, no matter who you are, I hear the spirit of the Lord say right now, $100, and you could get yourself a whole man. Whole man. But pastor, I say, if you didn't know what I say, I say, if you, you, you if you got, you, if you don't have that seed, then you're right, you can get him. But if you got the $100 seed, a whole dude you could get. Hold two arms and legs, foot and education. He got his own house. You don't have to do, you could live how you want to live. Sweetheart on him, make him as a side piece when you don't marry him, do all that. Just bring the $100. Y'all listening to this, right? I'm making light, but y'all know just what I'm talking about. How many circuses you've been to that they call conferences that they did this foolishness? But let's go back here though. Let's look at the root though. See, until you understand revelation, you will see exactly where you've been putting your money all this time in the ground of Satan. First Timothy 6 and 10, for the love preachers of money is the root of all, circle the word all, Circle the word of money is the motivator of all evil. Murder, rape, adultery, witchcraft, voodoo, sand, money is the root, according to that scripture. And this is the mess they bring in the house of God. Y'all see why I hate it so much? Y'all see why I despise this so much? You cannot hear the authentic word of God right now without at the end of that. TBN is a perfect example of it. They bring on the fancy preacher, call 1-800-779 right now, sow that seed right now. I don't like that. Right after that, I, well, 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 I, when I used to watch that, I used to shut it off before it get there. Because it's like you, 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 you performing for money. And I'm reading here, for the love of money is the root. It's, it didn't say it's the tentacle. It didn't say it was the branch. It didn't say it is the trunk. Uh-uh-uh. It said it is the life source. The root of anything is the life source of it. Pulpit bandits, casino prophets and prophetess, bonefish bishops. I hope you I, I hope you offended, you know. I really hope you offended. Now, when you don't calm down with your offense, now show me what I just taught was wrong. Because I read in the scripture. So if I wrong, the scripture wrong. Because I ain't giving you no opinion. I did what the scripture says. So he says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the what? Faith. What is the faith? The word of God. Isn't this what I'm telling you? This, this, what was my reason to you when I said I despise seed sowing. I said because it takes 
It, it pushes the word of God, which is faith, aside. It's telling people, you don't have to do all of what Kevin is saying. Yeah, you're reading it from the Bible, but this is a new dispensation. This is a new covenant. We are under grace. And grace means, they're contorting it again, that you don't have to abide by all of that New Testament stuff. So there's another covenant then. Aside from the new covenant, but there's a new, new covenant then. So the scripture is telling you, remember what he's saying. This is a revelation. He says the, the, the love of money is the root. Your pastor is the root of all evil if he love money. Your prophet and prophetess who's always begging for money and want to deposit money to all these different accounts, they are the them are the root of evil because of their love for money. I, 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 I can't polish it up no more. According to the scripture, that's what it's saying. If your pastor, if your prophetess, if your teacher, Kevin, or anybody who represent the fivefold ministry, their focus, more than 80, 60% of their preaching is about money. I am reading, for the love of money is the root of all evil. What did you read there? Did you read, for the sinner, the love of money is, for, no, he, no, 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 this for everybody, anybody who love money, anybody where money is their God, including the preacher. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. So I'm not, listen, I will never be surprised if a ministry is riddled with scandal, if a ministry is participating in sorcery and witchcraft. Listen, I could walk in there, and if I see everyone that they actually for seat, I can tell you right now, here, this place is a nest for devils, right here. This place is a nest. If they build in the church or whatever, it will never finish. It will, you know why? Because everything they're doing is on manipulation. Never. If you won't get deeper, I can guarantee you every member of this church is have terrible dreams about this place they build in or the church they're in right now. If the preacher's always begging for money. Why? Because what I keep telling you, your dream life is displaying your spiritual life. And for those who have prophetic dreams, God will show you the spiritual life of the church. He will show you the spiritual life of the pastor. But let's look at what is the root of all of this evil here? Because he's a money beggar. She's a money beggar. She's a seed beggar. Let's be real. Let's look at the scriptures. Don't, don't come at me. Look at the scriptures. It is saying to you, this is why your church is not growing. This is why everybody dying from cancer and diabetes and COVID in there, even though you claim to have the anointing in this place. This is why there's no authentic word there. Why? Because they have replaced the faith or the word of God with seed, with money. And what did the Bible tell you about money? Well, I'm reading here, according to 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, for the love of money is the root of of not some evil, but all evil. And he goes on to impound more revelation in this. Those preachers who are always begging for me, those lying prophets, giving false prophecies, and got you so blind, you play like you didn't hear it. We had a lying prophet here in the Bahamas, very well known, who prophesied that the former administration, we had an election a couple of weeks ago, that the former administration will retain the, the government of the Bahamas. They were oust out. But you can hear them right now. See there, Kevin, now why you could say that? Oh, Lord, don't touch God. What did God say in Deuteronomy 18, I think, verses 20 to 22 about a false prophet? Didn't he say, kill them? No, man, I just I just so tired of this fake religion. I'm so tired of these cover-ups. Call them out. The Bible says... Uh, I think it's Ephesians 5, somewhere. He says, we are to call out the works of darkness. Why, Kevin? Because there are people who are sitting there who are not as advanced as you in the gospel, who don't have a godly foundation like you and I. They're coming there, look, I want to learn more about this Jesus guy. I want to learn about more of these supernatural. But then there's liars up here telling lies. And none of it is coming to pass. And everybody in there is covering it up. No, well, don't touch that. That's the no, don't. God will judge them. No, the Bible tells me I will judge angels. So who is this mere mortal, this liar? Everybody, everybody just, it's almost like a cult. You got to cover up for prophetess, got to cover up for pastor. Don't speak against pastor. Some of them so insecure, nobody in the church, if you're speaking against me, I will kick you out. Oh, okay. All right, whatever. Call the liars out. How much are y'all suffering as a result of their lies in your life? God is showing me a new man in your life. I see you getting mad. I see little PZ children running all over the place, but I can cost you $500.
but it doesn't you normally charge one hundred dollars for the man yes but i see you're gonna have four children that's hundred dollars a piece you didn't see that coming <laughs> <laughs> liars why tell you these you could lie yeah? people just love their lies well, listen so he says for the love of money is the root of all evil while which while some coveted after they have erred or made mistakes and that word err there also means to go in the opposite direction in the greek they have erred from the faith from the word of god as a result of this love of money they start making up scriptures like you will be cursed if you don't pay tithe. But you're all paying tithe and still under the curse of poverty. So how do you explain that? I tell you one church I've been to, the pastor, uh, not the pastor, the one of the assistant pastors, after the pastor finished preaching, you could tell it was an orchestrated bunch of foolishness. He's, after the pastor, preach he went into the room and so the assistant pastor came on and he says oh my god what a good message mighty god i can feel the glory of god in there glory be to jesus he said you know in order for us to be free we got to we got to release bishop from his debt my god the house of god will not be released until the people release him from his debt look at them putting a curse on you and you you like fools just eating it right up what scripture can we find that if we release Moses from his death, we release Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, Ezekiel, you, you all don't read your Bible, eh? where could we find this? Well, so this is what the scripture means by they have, because of their love of money, they have erred from the faith. And pierce, listen, listen what's happening to them spiritually. And pierce themselves with many ROC because they don't see these things. They believe these things ain't happening. They don't understand the spiritual realm. The Bible says every time they hear from the faith and telling you lies and false prophecy, there's a spiritual spear that is going in them. There's a spiritual, their spears, some of them got so much, I surprised they even still live in. Scripture. I ain't making nothing up. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, mm, talk to me now. Flee these things. But so far, what is he talking about? He's talking about the many errors that people will make once they are operating outside of uh, the gospel of godliness or faith, which is the word of God. And that's what this whole text so far uh, of what he's projecting or speaking about. When we get into verse 12, it's going to really challenge us. So let's go back to verse 11. But thou, a man of God, meaning that you who decide not to take that route, not to listen to them, not to sow no seeds to these lies and thieves. Because the Bible, Jesus said, not us, Jesus said, they have turned my house, which was once a house of prayer, to a den of thieves. That's what Jesus called these preachers who are always asking you for seed. I don't care who they are, apostles, doctor, they are thieves according to scripture. You are trying to tell me now I mustn't say that, but I must be more kind. But that was Jesus there. That was not the example. He, he said, Amy, where? Where my house, which was supposed to be house of prayer? Prayer meaning communicating with me? But these vultures turned into a house of a, a, a den of thieves. That's what they are. You are a thief. You are a liar. Because according to uh, 476 verse 10, he says, for the love of money of the root of, of the root of all evil, and those who cover this money, they have erred from the faith, the word of God. Okay, meaning that they're creating their own gospel, like thieves do, to make you give. You're going to be cursed. If you want to be, I will have no, listen, you have your pastor say this, you, no one will be in this church. If you don't pay tithe to bring a close heaven over this church. What scripture is that? Liar. You are a thief and you are a liar. But I hope you offended. I just hope you offended. No, no, no church on this planet, based on the scriptures that I have relentlessly studied and will continue to study, could ever convince me to give no seed to them. Never. Especially if you don't have a pantry and a big one too that you don't only give to your family but anyone could walk up in there and ask for help and if they truly needed you would give it to them or if you don't have a branch or ministry given to the poor but you couldn't get a red cent from me never i refuse to to fund your error of the faith due to your love of money which is the essence and foundation of all evil according to scripture play with me 
Never. Never. You think I can put my money in dirt ground, in ground that is saturated with demons? You don't give to the poor? You don't make it a priority and getting your members to help other people outside of this church or even in the church, poor people in there and you overlooking them and I must give first, last, third, monkey food, donkey food? Boy, you will never in this life see that. Never. If I am dead and gone and catch them trying to pull that out of my hand, I will drag them in the grave with me. Never. Why would I curse my blessings that God is blessing me with abundantly? Because I'm making a point to not only point others to the poor, but I lead the pack in doing it. This ministry right here, primary function, assisting those. My final teaching tomorrow, I'm going to deal heavily with this again, with new revelation. You can calm down a little bit. Back to our regularly, regular scheduled program. <laughs> Give to their church. To build buildings. To, boy, you all got to be stupid. You got to be ignorant. You, I, I, you, that person don't respect me. You don't give to the poor. When through scripture it is showing tied, what is tied to the poor? Your, your, your salvation. And I can point this out in detail again tomorrow, but with more revelation. Where everywhere I'm reading in the Bible, it's a tie to a part of your Christian duty. And one of the primary ones is to assist the needy. And you on TV bragging, but I saw this African guy from Zimbabwe. They had this joke over here one time. Uh, some ministry had him over here, passion, fruit, whatever the hell he named, and he can talk fool, raping people financially and telling people he in his chariot ministering and he see angels and going and people are doing prophecy. How many of them pro ask them? Go right back and ask, bring every one of them he, pro he, he prophesied to. Come, come tell me, how have your life increased since then? I have no respect for these people and I have no respect for those who bring them here because you don't, you're clearly not hearing from God. You, they go back home with thousands of your money. Never gave you the word of faith. Never tro pointed you to the word of God. Never. And people entertain nonsense like that. I told them I, I was invited several times to come. And I said, listen, I have done my research on this man. I have, that's me. Whoever I can, I, I don't do my research. And I read an article where in his church in Zimbabwe, before he moved to the United States, he, I think a lady, I don't know if she was raped or she was pregnant. I know she was pregnant. And in this article, he claimed to have done a spiritual abortion on her. And then every minute I see him uh, showing his big house and Lamborghinis and, and, and Lamborghini Jeeps and all, all, all these poor people in his church, all these poor people in this community, he have seven, eight. Why would you need all of these cars when you could keep one? I don't care if it's a Lamborghini or what, but why aren't this going to the poor? No, man, no spiritual abortion. From the time I read that and many other incriminating, because I did my research before he came here because there was advice, ad, advertising him coming here how he's a man of god he's a man of the devil false prophecies many false prophecies have met with people counsel with people who we prophesy to and none of it came to pass particularly in the time that he said it would so man you you listen boy you all listen you're running all your you're messing with boy don't come with me that foolishness because i don't entertain and give and every again money 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 so into this then he tell them you got to sow this amount of money for god for this and they always i know they come to the bahamas I can tell you one person who ain't going to be in the audience. It can be given you. And they wouldn't get a penny from me. No way you see where they help other people. Hmm. So verse 11 of 1 Timothy 6 says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Don't be a part of these people. Come out of their congregation. He said, flee. You know the word flee? In the Bible, that mean break off running. You know what that means? So if you was going north, take off running. Then the south, south direction. Go totally opposite. He said, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. What things? From verse 3 to verse 10, all of what he was saying, which represent ungodly living, which is not of the gospel of godliness and faith. He said, flee these things and follow, listen, after righteousness. What Kevin is telling you right now, Kevin don't tell you his opinion. He says, listen, follow this protocol. What did Kevin tell you to get favor? Kevin says, go look at Psalms 5 verse 12. Go look at... Proverbs 4, verses 3 to 4. He, and he, what did he say to you? He even break it down. He says, now listen. He says in Proverbs 3, verse 3 says, 
forsake not mercy and truth. He says, now listen, it's a protocol. Forsake not mercy and truth. And he says, bind it upon your neck and write it upon the table of your heart. That's that's just uh, a, a, a metaphor. You, you can't tie it literally around your neck and write it on your heart. But he, the, 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 the comparison is what he said. That's how close mercy and truth should mean to you and demonstrate it to other people. That's the protocol. The result, if you follow that protocol, because this is what Kevin is teaching you, which is righteousness and godliness, he said the result of that now, well, not only will you obtain favor and good understanding, but before God and man. So Kevin didn't say in there, yeah, that's the scripture now, but you got to sow a seed now. Come on, faith without works is dead. This is error in the scriptures. You are adding something that's, that does not line up with what that scripture is saying. It told you what to do. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Follow this protocol. And you are guaranteed favor and good understanding, not just limited with God, but also with man. Nowhere in there, sow a seed. Nowhere in there, give your best fruit. Nowhere in there, God says, take this anointed oil, buy this for $7 million, and wherever you pour this, you can get $7 billion. Nowhere in there. He said, from these people, stay far from. Who's adding and taking away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of righteousness and godliness? So again in verse 11 and 1 Timothy 6, he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. What is righteousness? God's way of doing things, the right way. The only right way is the way God had laid it out in the scriptures. Whether it's a commandment, protocol, precept, whether it's a, an ordinance, that is righteousness. That is what God requires of us to follow it. It's amazing how preachers all about preaching about the law of first mention, glory be to God, how it is mentioned in the Bible. It is that order that you follow it in. Well, why are you adding to it? Why are you taking away from it? And, and, and amazingly and conveniently, most of the augmentation or the alteration of the scriptures is only when it's time to get money. Why? Because it's the root of all evil. And it speaks a lot about the one who's always asking for it. So he says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things, the 11th verse of 1 Timothy 6, and follow after righteousness and godliness, faith, which is the word of God, love, patience, meekness. These are all fruits that will be produced when I follow after righteousness and godliness. But verse 12 is what I, or where I wanted to get to. Verse 12, first sentence. Fight the good fight of fate. Glory be to God. Now let me talk to you. What is fate again? The word of God. And we, the believer, believers are being advised to fight. Now, let me see if I could put this in perspective, and maybe you could help me. To fight would be the same as to contend. So to fight something will automatically indicate that there is an opposite or an opposition challenging me, right? And if I'm asking by the writer, who would have told me all of these things that represent ungodliness and not to follow them, but if I follow godliness and righteousness, it's going to produce faith, patience, meekness, love, and so on. These will be the fruit that I will display as a result of the evidence of being one that is righteous and godly. Again, Jesus keeps saying to his followers, you will know them by their fruit. You know, don't mind what they call themselves. No mind all of the doctorate degrees and all of this stuff that they get. And that's beautiful that they discipline themselves to attain such status in terms of education. But he says, listen to me carefully now, watch their fruit. Because of their doctor so-and-so, reverend so-and-so, and they're following righteousness and godliness, you should see faith, which is the word of God. In fact, if you look at this, it says, faith, love, patience, and meekness, that should be the fruit that this representative or practitioner of godliness and righteousness should be exuding or performing. The opposite is true. But then in verse 12, and we only can take that first sentence, fight the good fight of faith. 
Again, because the adjective good is put before the word fate, you could be fighting, you could be fighting the bad, sorry, you could be fighting the bad fight of fate. What is the bad fight of fate, Kevin? When you're sowing seed, when you're talking nonsense, but your past is your spiritual covering and your spiritual father and your spiritual bastards and orphans talking nonsense. If your past is your mentor, okay, I bet you on that. If your apostle is your mentor, I bet you, what spirit, how do you birth spiritual children? Make, make me understand it. I know how it's physically done. A male and a female come together where a male uh, it puts a sperm, it uh, fuses with the woman egg, form the zygote, then it turns into a baby and they embryo and they give birth eventually nine months. How does it happen spiritually? How does a person become a spiritual father? Make me understand that. All of this is false garbage and witchcraft. Make me understand that. Make me. I want no. I am dumb, stupid, and retarded. I won't be educated though. So tell me how did you become my Bible type must call no man father. So forget spiritual. How did you become a spiritual father? Spiritual mentor? Yes, I got you. Just spiritual mentees? Oh, I got you there. Make plenty of sense. But how did you become a spiritual father? So much so that everything I do in my life, I gotta tell you. A, 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 a man who have to repent to God just like me. A man who have the access to the throne of grace because of the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus provided, that we, he, 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 the only petition between me and God is Jesus the Christ. Where did this joker come from? But he's my spiritual father. And what spiritual fathers do you have? Because Jesus provides healing. Jesus provides sanctification, deliverance, salvation. Jesus restored Kevin's life. Jesus broke the curses through his principles. So you, spiritual father, what, what, show me your spiritual, what, what book do you have where I can read your uh, principles that I can follow and I'll be delivered from the same thing? Spiritual father. I have never seen in, 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 in my 51 years of living so many people volunteering to be spiritual orphans, to have a spiritual mother and father. I, I, this is beyond my understanding. And what are these spiritual parents teaching them? Are they teaching them faith and living godly? No, sow a seed. In order to be under this apostolic Pentecostal Baptist covering, you need to sow a seed so this, it'll be activated the day you, just like if you have a post office box, if you're not paying the yearly rent on it, then we yank it from you. So that means if you're not paying us a seed for this covering, then you, 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 you cover less. Oh, wow. Man, Jesus never charged me for a seed. Sorry for covering. He told me, if I accept him as Lord and Savior, he will be with me until the end. Never charge me a dime. So you, who Jesus made, where can I find in the scripture where he gave you that authority over anybody in the body of Christ? Where do you have that power over me? So much so, with the false gospel that you're talking about here, that you, you, you could tell you now that there is a spiritual coat or covering over me to protect me from what? But I'm not surprised. Why? Because when these things all boil down, it's going to take us right back here to verse 10 of First Timothy 6. For the love of money is the root, not the branch, not the leaves, not the fruit. It said it's the root of all evil. The root is the foundation. The root is the source and where all the evil is perpetrated. Cut the root, and the trunk, the branch, the leaves, the fruit, and everything dies. So he says in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. You, Kevin, listen, you decided to follow me. You decided to make my word priority as I have advised you. Kevin, is going to be a fight. Kevin, they can come after you. Kevin, they can come with everything. They can come with divorce. They can come with every. They can nitpick. They can screen your life. But Kevin, don't worry about that. You Fight the good fight. You let fate speak for you, which is the word of God. You decree it. You live by it in spite of what they say, in spite of what they do, in spite of how they come at the... Because Kevin, they're not coming at you, you know. They're coming at the word of God in you. They hate the fact that you are bringing light to the understanding of people that they don't have to do those evil witchcraft rituals anymore. They don't have to do it anymore. All you have to do is follow the simple word of God. Fight the good fight of fight. He, he says, Kevin... The statement is made because there is automatic opposition when you take your stance with the word of God. 
Kevin, when you tell people worldwide on social media, stand firm in the word of God, not in your problems, not in your past, and not even in you, Kevin. Stand flat-footed in the scriptures. Stand flat-footed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care about your past. I don't care about none of them. You care about the word of God. And any one of them that is not pointing you to the word of God, then the Bible is telling you. Is, what did he say? Let's read it again. Verse 11 of 1 Timothy 6 when they're not giving you the scriptures. But thou, O man of God, if you are a true man or woman of God, these are your instructions. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, with things, from verse 10 to verse 3, going back up, and follow after righteousness and godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. These are the things that's going to be produced from your life, son, man, woman of God, if you are doing it God's way. There has to be positive fruit. There has to be some form of growth in your life in terms of what the Bible say you will produce if you're following the word of God. If the word of God is the core of you, it is impossible for you to be held back. It is impossible for you to be five years in Christianity and still experiencing delays, still under generational curses, still barely could go forward, still working a job with underpaying you, still having degrees, huh? All these degrees, and you are the the the, uh, the 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 employee of an employer who you both of you graduated together from high school, but they never went any further than that. You got all kind of doctorate, but yet they're your boss. But you've been saved for six point nine eight million years. You the one back flipping in church and giving seed all the time, giving offering first fruit, giving pastor, buying them suits, cars, all this. Where is the results? The love of money is the root of not some evil, that's not what I read there, all evil. But the writer in verse 12 of 1 Timothy 6, he said, contend, fight, fight viciously, meaning using the word of God, not physically, fight the good fight of faith. The word good here means beneficial, something that will uh, uh, be of good to you or be of a benefit to you, will support you. So he says fight or contend or resist with the, the good, do the, the good uh, fight of faith. Meaning that you're not uh, always trying to be difficult with people. Well, what is your views about the Sabbath? I think the Sabbath is like any other commandment. I don't think the Sabbath has changed. It is in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is still applied today. You, we can't take away from it. It's in there. So you're saying that, uh, no, you're saying, let's start off with that, because you didn't hear me say anything. What, what, say what you're saying. Well, what do you think? Can you do it on a Sunday or Monday? I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I am done with you. So you got to shut them down because they're not coming here to teach you how to fall in love with the word of God, how to apply. They are always looking for some nonsense to debate. So what do you think about wearing jewelry? Could you kindly leave, please? How is this going to bring souls into the kingdom of God? Make, make me understand that. See, people, you got to shut these fools down immediately. You cannot, if, we say in the Bahamas, if you give them an inch, they'll take a whole yard. I shut them down, right? I don't debate scripture. I don't debate it. Now, if you got a sensible conversation, you will say, but Kevin, I don't understand this. What do you think about divorce and marriage? What do you think about the Sabbath day? Could it be any day, whatever? I will give you what the Bible says. But if you come here looking for controversy, boy, you roll up on the wrong brother because you ain't gonna get it from me. And I will dismiss you. I will dismiss you because remember, these are these are people who are trying to distract. These are the people who they are so, where they were under such false teachings for so long, they are just programmed a certain way that they're not looking for truth. No, they want to infuse you with their version of the truth. But you got to be wise. Wise like serpents, like the Bible says. Says. Okay, and you gotta shut those fools down right away. I shut them down. But listen, listen to me, yeah. They don't. I don't play with them, you know. They know. Listen, I used to have a group of Jehovah's Witnesses. Used to. They don't come here no more. And I know in their training camp, 
when they show my street, they say, now, put an x-ray there. Don't go to this dude. This dude there is no good. He ain't going to listen to a word you say. All he can do is quote scripture all day. While you show him this, he can just give you scripture after scripture. Then he can tell you, explain it, even though you come to push your evil gospel on him. They don't come here no more. I watch them go to every other neighbor except this house right here. Why? Because I don't entertain nonsense. I don't entertain nonsense. When I read about hellfire, when the Bible says the liar and the whoremongers and the sorcerer will be cast into the lake of fire, and you look at me in my face, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, tell me that hellfire isn't, don't exist, and that when you die, that's the end of you, there's nothing else. What Bible you, get out of my yard, please, if I call the police. <laughs> Talking nonsense. You got to shut them down, and if a Jehovah's Witness is offended that on you, it's a false gospel. It's going, again, it's an error of the gospel of godliness. So don't come to me, listen, I tell you before, you know, I ain't your regular preacher. I don't tell you all this. So don't be surprised when you see the side of me. I don't put up with that. Nobody, listen, I have been in bondage for years under the church system. And it has become worse over the years because of the introduction of seed sowing and pushing the Bible. It's literally pushed, it has literally pushed the Bible out of the, the, the true church of, but I haven't said the true church of God because the true churches of God stick with the scriptures. But those who live a form of godliness, they have literally pushed the scriptures and the word of God, the essence of why we should be there listening. They've moved that and replaced it with riddles and rhymes and you got to get oily and, and all this foolishness and then uh, now give us a seat. We done put on a good performance now. You see, you, you think running on these, swinging from these chandeliers, you know how much energy that take, huh? You know how much we pastors got to go to the gym and boycott to swing on this chandelier, do the crip walk, plus we had to throw in some cabbage patch and a little sprinkle of the prep. And you don't expect us to oversee it? <laughs> Listen. So if you choose to state it out on you, he says, contend for the good fight. Of the good fight. He said, contend. Expect opposition when you go on the fast. Expect opposition. Like I'm convincing you to speak the word of God. There can be opposition. There's, but they're not coming for you. Just like Matthew 13, I think it was, where Jesus talked about the parable of the seed and the sower. And when he break it down, he says, listen, the 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 the, the farm or the husbandman represent uh, the preacher. Sorry, the sower represent the preacher. The seeds that he was sowing represented the word of God. And the various grounds that he was planting these seeds in represented the different conditions of the hearts of men. And the first one he says, now, when the sower sowed the word, on this particular ground, he said the devil came there immediately and consumed it. Then the next ground, uh, the seed began to grow quickly, but it had no root, no substance. That's where most of these churches are right now. Money, 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 money. So you can never have the true substance, which is the word of God. So you jump it up around because you figure there's a place where you come and do a lottery. I done so $5 million since I've been here. I know God can turn it around for me. He said, these are the one who cooks quickly. They get uh, charismatic, no true word in them, no solid foundation. And then they all collapse, get disappointed, church hurt, they walk away, want nothing to do with God. But God never did them nothing. It is these lying preachers that did it, and these lying prophets and prophetess. That's who did you something. You equated them with God, and they never represented God because you, they never pointed you to the scriptures. So you had no kind of, nothing to negotiate with. Now that they fail you, you never had the word to say, well, well, I don't care about them. I know what the word saying. I can stick with this word. All you were going on was the hype, the glamour, the theatrics. They were going on all of the big pitches, the big, uh, this is the year of being debt free. All of this, no scriptural teaching to teach you to be responsible. What do you do if God were to bless me with a million dollars right now? Well, you can do what you always did. No, okay, Kevin, I can be honest with you right now. If, I, if God bless me with that, boy, first of all, you know, I'm a single mother and I'm going to open up a single mother's shelter retreat and I can feed the... Mm, what evidence can you show me where you're making an attempt to do that now? In fact, let me make it very simple for you. Give me evidence where you shared a plate of food with somebody. Maybe you'll convince me with that. Because how could you could do something on such a grand scale when you're doing none of it now? That's like the compulsive pathological chronic liar that will say to you, if God blessed him with a, a, a ten thousand dollars, they'll sow thousand dollars tied. Why would stop it? You 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 get a paycheck every end of the week, month, whatever. People bless you. When did you take ten percent out of that and bless 
somebody with it. You never did. So you know how difficult it is for you who've never had $10,000 before. You got it. And now the dev, because it's time to contend for the faith. God is telling you to bless such and such with this amount, not even 10%, whatever. You'd be like, boy, that ain't God. No way. God will never tell me to do that. That's Satan. Satan, I rebuke you. Get away from me, you devil. I will give them up. Then now when you're so convicted, you know, I look at them. Mm, Kevin don't need that. He, he do look at he doing good. No, I know. God show you something. No, I know. No. But guess who would need it? Uh, the weave store. Yeah, the weave store. Yeah, glory. This Jesus talking to me right here. I need me $4,000 weave. And uh, let me see some mascara and liner. And by the time you get down to $50, Oh Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, I can I guess go to church tonight. I want to hear the prophetess. And the prophetess who working with the Satan and who know everything you're doing through familiar spirits. And he said to you, I don't know, but God says there's somebody in here. There's a fifty dollar man waiting on you. That when you get a frog come, that's the devil. Fifty dollar man. Who got the fifty? And you with your last fifty thinking this God. And you run up there like a donkey and give your fifty dollars for a Harvard Oxford graduate who disciplined themselves, who budgeted their monies, who wanted more of life, so they prepared and planned for it. You never did that. And you let uh, uh, Howdy Doody over here swing you with a $50 for a $50 man. They should flog you publicly. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Fight the good fight of faith. All I'm saying to you tonight, I'm finished. The word of God is faith. It is not only faith, but the protocol of this faith is you must believe the faith that you're giving back to God, which is the only thing that pleases him in terms of when you come to him for something. I've given you a myriad of scriptures to support not what I think, but what the scripture is saying. If you continue to follow ministries that beg and beg, the root of that ministry is evil because they are lovers of money. They, I don't care how much you adore them. I don't care how much titles they have. I don't care what they call themselves. Look at the evidence. How much have they grown? What have they done to for society? Look at themselves. Look how they live compared to the congregants. But let's look at the ministry that's always giving, though. Let's look at them who's always giving. And not giving for the cameras to be on them. No, they avoid that. They deflect that. They don't want that. They give in secret. They're helping people all over the world. And you know when you can hear about these people? You know, mostly when they die, but it don't matter. Everybody could come up and say, well, boy, I remember when this one, he, he, he she did this and they did that. Because they, they don't, they don't, you know, they, they don't care about being on camera. You know why? Because they understand scriptural rules. Which says, when you give your arms, give it in secret. And the God who sees you doing stuff in secret will reward you openly, Kevin, you ain't living that. I keep telling you that you're living that right now. But those who are just so camera hungry, who who, who crave for attention, he come, come here, come here, poor man. Now, I don't normally do this, you know, oh Lord, and I fight the Holy Spirit, Jesus, Lord. I say, the Holy Spirit, you sure you want me to do this? I was in my shower, I was on the toilet, you know, I was on the toilet, just had a bowel movement, and the Holy Spirit said, come off, wipe up, and come on, come. Come, come, to come. And I said, come here, Tom. Tom, tell them what I did for you. Yeah, well, you know, Brother Kevin, you, praise God, you bought me. Said, no, I didn't only, I bought you some drawers too. Tell them, tell them come, to, tell them you, who gave you drawers? Because you had none. Tell them. Thank you, Holy Spirit. See, that's that's what they into. You know what the Bible say? He said they have received their reward already. That's their reward. Whatever praises or accolades they get from the public, he said that is their reward right there. Those who don't want no publicity, they are convinced, not that they can get a reward, you know, but this is being recorded by God. And in Matthew 25, verses, I think 31 to verse 40, he said, especially in verse 40, I love it. He said, when you supply to those who are hungry, naked, and didn't have a place to stay, Jesus said, at that moment, you were doing it for me. That's the reward true givers look forward to not what men could give them or temporary praises and then flip on them the more and call them no good and everything but a child of god no i doing this because this is the gospel of godliness this is the gospel of righteousness 
and God himself will reward me. Yes, he can reward me now, but as I'm about to do my last teaching on encouraging with fasting tomorrow, I'm going to show you where all of this is tied to your salvation, and your salvation isn't just accepting Jesus Christ. You are going to see what you would have done for those who are less fortunate than you is going to play a pivotal role on what you deem as salvation. All right, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your gospel, your gospel according to your word of godliness, your gospel of righteousness, meaning your way, the God way of doing things. Not man's twisted way, not our ideology, and all of a sudden we just come from college and we have a deeper revelation of the scriptures and those revelations are always pulling or adding to the scriptures. No, the godly revelation is same scripture, but God is giving a deeper insight of what that scripture is revealing to us, especially as it's dealing with certain areas of our lives. I pray for everyone that have watched this video, listen, who will listen again, and those who will watch it in the future. Impart to them the spiritual insight of what is being revealed here. Challenge that particular area of their lives. I, I love where your son Jesus Christ, when he, when he spoke to a multitude, or no matter what topic it was, for some reason, even if that topic was love or kindness, no matter what those people were going through, that message resonated with every person's situation. Lord, let the revelations and the ministries and our presentation and declaration of your word, let it be that same way, that no matter, we don't know these people's problem, we don't know what they're going through, but when we speak under the unction of the Spirit of God and sticking to the Word of God, then the Word of God will now do what it's supposed to do and affecting everyone listening. Even though we're not speaking on their particular matter, they could pull the law, or rule, or revelation from that teaching and apply it to their matter. I speak that over this people right now. I decree that over this people right now. I pray everyone listening to me right now, God, please hear me. Please hear me while I'm on this, this, this. Today's my 39th day of fasting. And Father, I am begging you during this time of fasting that you break the, the, the stubborn spirit of tradition over them. Those who are just bound, those who are so fearful that if they stop paying their tithe, which is not commanded by you to them. If they, if, they, if they come from under a church, they are convinced by their lying leaders that, that they're going to die, they're going to be cursed. Father, why will you curse your body if you're sending them to another uh, place to get greater education in your word? When this church would have done the part that you wanted that person to receive, and now you take them to another ministry to get even more. Why would you say they are cursed, Lord? That's not you. Father, clearly, wherever there is fear, there is clearly a lack of faith. I pray right now, Father God, that the people who are battling fear, particularly as it, become, as it relates to their religious leaders, particularly as it relates to these dens of devils who are money-hungry dogs, as I relate to them, that their eyes would be open and that they would see it based on the scriptures, not my opinion. I read scripture after scripture support, nothing to do with my opinion. That is what your words say. Let the people, God, none of us know, none of us know when we will slip from time into eternity. We don't know. My own could be 10 minutes from now. Theirs could be a week from now. Some people listening to this right now who I will never meet, your appointment with death possibly could be next week. You've resisted God, or you even feel that what I'm saying is nonsense because your church teaches something different from the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not fighting me. I want to be clear. You are fighting for your eternal soul. You don't even realize this. And when you slip away at the appointed time next week, you like every one of us, including myself, have to stand before Christ with no excuses. You cannot say you wasn't exposed to the word. Yes, you heard a lot of garbage in your church. Yes, you heard a lot of riddles and rhymes and nursery rhymes and foolishness, but you were also exposed to the authentic word of God, but you made a decision. 
and your decision was, I like what they say more over here. I like the fact that I don't have to read. I don't have to study. I don't have to really put emphasis on the word of God. Well, all I can't, what I can do to circumvent all of that is let me put some money in the, let me put the, the seed, which is the money in the soil, which is this den of thieves. Let me put the ball in your court. What should God do with you? You rejected his law. Your choice. You've made the decision. So I'm, I'm crying out to everyone listening to me right now, even those who claim to know Jesus Christ, because I got a message for you tomorrow. Because if you are not assisting others, I'm not talking about those who you cherry pick. If you are not assisting others, this plays an integral part of your salvation. You got to stand before God and say, what did you do with the fellow on the street hungry? What did you do with the fellow at the ATM? What did you do with the fellow who you judged him? You said, I'm not giving it to this alcoholic. I'm not giving it to this drunkard. That's not your business. God will judge him. God will say to that same person, if they didn't do well and use the monies, which you gave them for what? Johnny? In spite of your condition, in spite that you were on drugs, in spite I made provisions for you because I shine on the just and the unjust. And I touched Mary over here to bless you. She was challenged at first because she knew you were on drugs, but you said you wanted something to eat. She blessed you that I, I will enough for her to do that to you in spite of your condition. Every blessing I gave you, you used it for Satan. People I'm telling you right now, and a lot of you are like this. I've had many people come to me, Kevin, what if the person on drugs? Okay, you were in sin. What did Jesus do with you? Did he did he send you straight to hell? When many years of warning you, many years of your fornications and lies and stealing and, and undermining people and working witchcraft and going in the graveyard and making sacrifice. He could have strike you dead right there on the graveyard, but he spared your life. But he pulled you out of that. And now you see somebody who now have, they don't have the same situation you have, but all sin is sin. But now you could now say what sin needs should be met and what shouldn't. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. I don't care if they're on drugs, it don't matter to me. You're hungry? Now, if you could do this, you could say, okay, well, I don't feel safe giving the money. Let me go buy them something to eat. But don't turn them down if you are being led by God to give to them, is what I'm saying. Because not everyone you should give to. And I always say this to you if you are led by God. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that these people will just, even on their fast, ask you to break the spirit of tradition break that religious spirit break that mindset that has literally enslaved them they have literally become co-conspirators to these fake leaders these liars these thieves these people who have no conscience for god I just, a friend of mine my best friend always tell me say kevin you always saying that but the truth is you gotta believe in god first and i agree with him i i keep thinking how could they believe in God and do what they do? But like he would have said to me, Kevin, they don't believe in God. How could you, Kevin, if the burner on the stove is turned on and it's fiery red, you are convinced that if you put your hand, it will burn you. That's true, that's true. So you wouldn't put your hand there, right? No, because you believe in it, right? That's true. So if you believe in God and you say you worship God, but you could go sneak and cheat on your wife and husband and lie and steal and cheat and, and undermine people on the job and, you know, throw people under the bus. But if pastor pull up, you're a saint. But when he go, you're a regular person. But you say you believe in God. Wouldn't God be watching you all the time? Why you don't show the same respect for him? So my friend, Clifford Bo, I remember you say Clifford, they don't believe in God. And it's the truth. I had, I had a rough time, Clifford, I ain't gonna lie to you. I had a rough time trying to wrap that around my head, but I finally did it. They don't believe in God. They scream, they preach because it's practice. Anyone, I could do it. You know just what to say. You know just right music to play to get the people going. But the truth is, like Jesus said, their hearts are far from me. They don't believe in me. They don't believe in God. The evidence is there. How could you, after church, go and have sex with somebody? You just finished coming off the praise and worship team. You just finished preaching. You just finished giving a fiery sermon. Only to sleep under the slip under the sheets with somebody else who was not your partner. You are not married. And if you are married, this is not your wife or husband. You couldn't believe in God. But you are more fearful that pastor or apostle or a church member don't see a car at the motel knowing that this shouldn't be here. That's where your fear is. But never the fact that God is watching you engage in sin. You could die right there. You can't believe in God. So I agree with Clifford. They don't believe in God. They don't. 
So it should not surprise us, Lord, that they behave the way that they do. What is surprising and treacherous as they are convincing others to follow on the path of destruction. The Bible says that broad is the way that will lead to destruction and narrow and straight is the way excuse me, that leads uh, to righteousness or the, or the way of life. And listen to what it says. Excuse me, it didn't end there. It says, and, and, and only few will find their way there. They find their way there. I believe the scriptures. So I'm praying, Father God, that even those who are engaging in a genuine fast right now, even myself being on this 30 night of 40 days, I bind my fate with theirs, Lord. I bind my fate with theirs, and I pray that you would impute into their spirit, man, after you have eradicated every form of residue, residual, or remnant of anything that is anti-you. Now infuse them with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Father, give them an insatiable desire for your word. Let your word become their life. Let them realize that this is the only currency that heaven will respond to. Let them come to the understanding, according to Hebrews 11 verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please you. Let that be their governing thought that in, in, in order to please my God, I have to do it his way. And that way is following the word of God, which is faith. I pray that everyone who is on a genuine emphasis fast, doing exactly what the scripture says to do, primarily meeting the needs of the less fortunate, I pray, Lord, that, well, I thank you, Lord, not I pray, because if they're doing it the right way, I thank you in advance for answering them. I thank you, Father God, that you will do for them what you did for me back on my original 40-day fast in 2011. You did in Ephesians 3 verse 20. And what is that? You did exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that I could ever ask or think according to the power of the Word of God that that was operating in me. In other words, God exceeded my greatest expectation of what I was requesting on my fast. He has gone beyond what I was was going to settle for, more or less, because I believe in the Word of God, not in the fast itself, but the Word of God. And the fast was only a springboard to take me to another level. So I pray right now, Lord. I pray for those that are seeking healing. Thank you for it already. I pray for those who want their children to come not only back on an alignment, your original alignment, but that these children will fulfill the will of God for their lives. I pray for those that are in in horrible marriages. I pray that you bring restoration. But overall, I pray your will be done because there are many facets of that. I pray, Father God, for those who are challenged in their mind with fear, fear of the future, fear if they will die, fear if they will go hungry and not have a job and can't pay the bills and get kicked out and become homeless and sleep in cars. Father, wherever there's an an overwhelming uh, fear, it is certainly a major lack of faith, which is the word of God. So it is my prayer, Father God, Lord, that through all of these teachings that I'm doing in terms of the encouragement during their time of fasting, that that in every every sermon. I am pounding the word of God. I'm pounding. I'm, I'm showing them the scriptures. Get in the word of God. Pre- sorry. Repeat. Declare. Declare. Re- proclaim the word of God. Speak it in your bathroom. Speak it on your toilet. Speak it while you're walking, driving. Speak it while you're at work. Res- play it in your mind. Whatever you are asking God for, make sure you have the scriptures to correlate with what you want. And give more of the scriptures. Declare it. I got favor. The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone, alone, man or woman. So God, I'm praying for a mate. But I didn't ask you for that. You know that. I'm giving you what the word says. You said that he that finds a wife find a good thing. Father, help me find my Eve. Like Kevin has found his. <laughs> so this is how you pray. You pray the word of God. You decree. Why? Because he says, my word cannot return unto me void. It cannot return unto me unaccomplished. It is impossible. If your belief, if your confidence is in the word of God, you cannot truly declare it and mean it and believe in it and it not produce. Impossible. 
God will not fail you if your confidence is in the word of God. Not a church, not a denomination, not a preacher, not even me. It must be in the word of God. So Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen and amen. I'm done, boy. I love that. I love the scripture. I, I hope, boy, Lord, I, I, Lord, please give these people an insatiable desire for your work. I want to thank all of you that came on tonight. And uh, I, I know you were blessed by the word of God, not me, by the, but the, by the word that came through me. And like I would have told you, this fast has really, I, I'm telling you, I am believing for some stuff now. And I've already seen the manifestation of it. But this is the real thing that I love. <sighs> the revelation and the understanding, the articulation and the presentation. I always had that, but I could feel the difference. I could even some, when I'm doing my walk, I did my walk this morning, my run walk. I'm like, like I'm just being flooded with scriptures like, because a lot of times when I minister, I don't know if I've ever told you this, when I minister, for the most part, I don't know what I'm going to teach on. So I'll always be like, okay, Holy Spirit, I know you're going to never abandon me. Tell me what you want me to teach on specifically on this particular topic. Now, I may not get something right away, but by the time I get home, relax, or whatever I'm doing, the scriptures would come. So I'll go quickly write them down. All right? And like my, because uh, the main Bible that I use is my King James Study Word Bible. And why I love that Bible is because each scripture in there, each verse, it would have like referencing other verses that correlate with that. So it makes it an easier study Bible. So for example, let's say um, reading no good things should be held from those that walk up rightly in that particular scripture, right? So they'll have the first sentence A, B, or C. That's why when you hear me say stuff like uh, my favorite scripture, Proverbs 11 verse 9B, 9B would be the second part of that scripture. So in this particular Bible that I use, which is the King James Study Word Word Study Bible, it gives that uh, opportunity to say, okay, now, no good thing. Look in Luke, look in Isaiah, all these different relative scriptures. With that also, it shows the Hebrew and the Greek, depending on which one you're in, and they have numbers to it, so you can now go look for deeper meaning of what that word means. Aside from that, that's why I love this Bible. It now, this is where it becomes awesome. It begins to show you the tense in which the person was speaking, whether it was a past tense, present tense, future tense. So all of this brings the understanding of the scripture. And if you are one who are blessed with the gift of teaching, this is going to become very easy to you because a teacher is always systematic. Right? Uh, I'll leave you this before I go. I was, uh, I said this to you before. Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to Nassau to uh, uh, Apostle Brenda Pratt and her husband, Dwight Pratt Church, to do a teaching on, uh, actually, it was more of a teaching lecture because they were doing uh, Bible classes, and this particular dream class was a part of them, I guess, getting their uh, whatever. So I normally would have my laptop and all my, I don't write out sermons. I could never teach like that. What I do is I have my points with my scripture. So if I'm teaching on dreams of backwardness, I'll have my scriptures. And the way that I am, I, I have like a photogenic memory. I, could, I know what I have to go to next. So what happened is when I got there and everything was fine, I was ministering, going with my flow. So I would come down. And I would expand on two particular scriptures. Then I would go back on the stage, knock my iPad to pull it back up to see where I go next. But guess what happened? Everything was erased from it. Everything was gone. Now, for the average person, they would have panicked right there. But you see, a teacher, is a good teacher that is, is systematic and repetitive. So because I already studied this prior to coming, it really, that was just more or less of a backup. Because really everything was here. So when I got down there, I just started flowing like crazy. So when they, when uh, Brother Dwight, Apostle Dwight, took me back to the hotel or wherever, 
I said, but you won't believe what happened to me. I said, do you know all of my notes was just miraculously somehow erased from my entire lap iPad? He said, what? He said, but you couldn't tell you just was flown. I say, yeah. So what I'm saying to you, with a gift of teaching, like with any other gift, it, it makes you different from someone who went to school for it. It makes you different from someone who trained for it. If this is what God has given you, are going to flow entirely different from the average person. You have to stand apart. Let me be clear, because I know people just read into things wrong. That don't make you better than anybody else. What I'm saying to you is, and I'm closing with this. On your fast, ask God, God, what do you have? What did you call me to do? I don't want to be wasting my time on this planet or in this church or under this ministry. If either A, I've exhausted my time here, B, there's nothing in here to point me to where my gifts are supposed to be, or C, I should have been gone a long time ago. What is your gift? No one could take this what I have. No one, the most they could do is be envious and try to throw obstacles and it'll only become springboard to take me where I needed to be. So I thank you for that, haters. But nevertheless, your, your, my, the, the source of your gift, the source of your healing, the source of your teaching, the source of your words of wisdom, knowledge, and the sight, whatever, the source of it as a believer of Jesus Christ is the word of God. The word of God to me, as it relates to how I minister effectively, is equivalent to Samson, the world's strongest man, and the source of his strength was the seven locks on his head. When that was cut, he was a regular man. If you take me away, if I don't, if I don't get to read or study or the word or have nothing, if you take that away from me, I will not perform the way that I do. That is my source. That's why you hear me talk about it so much. I say all that to say this. Finally, in life, for most of you, allow the word of God to become your source. Father, if my gift is teaching, if my gift is singing, whatever it is, Father, point me to your word. Get me to study. Give me a spirit to study and meditate upon your word day and night. And what did the Bible say when that happened? Then you shall become like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth your fruit, your gifts in your season. No man could stop you. You know how many people try to stop me? You know how many people wrote to my the radio station to get me off the air? You know how many people to, to pastors, ain't no sinners, pastors and apostles and prophets all fail. Why? Because God, I didn't call me there. God called me there. They will only stop you when you agree with them to stop you. It ain't gonna happen yet. So anyway, y'all have a good night, man. I'm gonna be back tomorrow. I'm not sure I'm gonna be on tomorrow morning. I would love to. It all depends on how I feel after I finish my walk because I'm really tired. But if I feel good, I will come back tomorrow morning. If not, then I'll come back at the same time uh, tonight and finish with my, because it'll be my 40th day fasting tomorrow. 40 days. I feel good. I feel very, very good. A lot of you have been calling me. I told you a long time, do not call me because I'm not answering no phone. I'm on a 40-day detoxing fast. I don't need to hear nothing from you right now. When I finish, I will deal with you then. Don't be offended. That on you, if you're offended, go get safe. Tell God, take the spirit of offense from you. I can deal with me before I can deal with you. 40 days in. 40 days in. I feel good. Lost a lot of weight. I, I just feel good. And those of you who are doing it, you will make it if you every day, like I told you, ask God and thank him for the grace that he's given you to bring you to this point. Remember, I tell you, happiness is being contented with what you have now. Be contented. Show gratefulness and God will bless you with more, right? So God bless you. You have a great night and I will see you tomorrow.